This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Apple's still minting more money than God, right? Geopolitics front and center for global Wall Street. With Lisa Mateo on markets. Stocks are coming off of another record high. And Michael Barr with news. U.S. Secretary of State discussed the conflict in Gaza. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. Tom Keen, Paul Sweeney, John Tucker in for Lisa Mateo. She was at Mel's Diner last night. She was? Okay. Sunset Boulevard. Yep. She's out there on social. Out She's there out social. in L.A. She was very social, I yep. thought, as well. Yep. Carol Masser and Tim, they're out at the, in Seattle at the Green Report. We're here for CPI this morning. We welcome all, all of you. It's a busy day all of a sudden. We've got earnings we can talk about. Ed yep. Denny with a stunning research uh, note. But CPI, 830 front and center. Yeah, absolutely, Tom. It's a key inflation gauge for this Federal Reserve. We're looking for, you know, moderating inflation. We'll see how that plays out. And as you mentioned, Tom, earnings. Pepsi, a little bit weaker than expected. Sales volumes. I, I, I'm buying my Fritos. I don't know what's going on out there. Uh, Delta had some good revenue, some good traffic, but costs are a challenge there for that airline. Yeah, and, and the nuance of uh, 45 headlines out from Delta to me is okay. And this is like a Helene Becker question. Yep. When do they, George, George Friedman, when do they cut capacity? They right. build out, as, as Jess Menton just yep. said to Amy Morris, when, do, you know, they build out capacity during the pandemic. I guess things are, it's a teensy weensy bit slower, not much. Yeah. How do you cut back? What yeah, what, what flights do you That's cut back? It's a tough back? business to manage. There's it is variables, brutal. You know, in that airline business. Um, and it all comes down yeah. to the consumer and pricing and fares. We'll and talk about this as we have time Low this factor. morning. Edward Yardeni, Ari, please get this up on YouTube as well. Ed Yardeni comes out and says, I was wrong. <laughs> He's now more bullish than he was two days ago. He okay. calls it a melt up. And he's looking now from 5,600 to 5,800 on the Standard & Poor's 500. That's a fraction to move up here. But he reaffirms Standard & Poor's 8,000, Paul, so. end of the decade, which is Where Dow 56,000. Is okay. anybody framing that? I don't no. think so. I'm looking at we're just just shy of 40,000 on the Dow, which we hit about right. a month ago. Our interns are talking to Ed Denny's interns. Right. We'll get them in here uh, at some point. We're on YouTube. Search and subscribe out to Bloomberg Podcast. Please subscribe to Bloomberg Podcast out there with a live chat. I haven't tuned in. I'll get to it uh, in a moment. Apple CarPlay, Android Auto as well with the Bloomberg Business Flash. John Tucker. He's no Lisa Mateo. Yeah, well, maybe I don't want to be. Uh, traders uh, waiting for the inflation data, of course, uh, at 830 for reassurance. The Fed the interest rate cuts are on the way. Now, Bloomberg Economics expects the June CPI report to be, quote, really good uh, to borrow Fed Chair Jerome Powell's characterization of uh, the recent inflation prints. Uh, Dow futures right now 57 points lower. That's down about a tenth of a percent. The S&P E-mini futures, they're down six. That's down a tenth of a percent. NASDAQ futures right now uh, 17 points lower. Two-year yield unchanged, 462. The 10-year right now unchanged. That is at 428. Among the most active in pre-market trading shares of Pfizer up about 4%. New York-based Pfizer, the company saying it's advanced development of a once daily weight loss pill. Again, shares of Pfizer up 3.6%. And of course, companies opening their books. You mentioned Delta, those shares right now, they are down 9% in pre-market trading. And we check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker, and that is your Bloomberg Business Flash, Paul and Tom. John, thanks so much. Lots of good economics today translated into the markets. Michael Nathanson will join us oh, in the yeah. 9 o'clock hour on the entertainment so madness. Paul, familiar with that, to yeah. say the least. Kate Moore, Randall Krosner of Boo School Chicago, the former Fed governor. Claudia Sam. Yeah, nice. It's a real tag team, aren't Very we? Good. To have Claudia Sam and Randy Krosner. Yep. The interns are killing it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's just, just killing it. Starting strong, Jonathan Pingle. UBS joins us this morning. Jonathan, what is the new character of our national disinflation? <laughs> well, I mean, what we've got going on right now, we're continuing to see uh, goods inflation uh, disinflate and be a sort of a key reason. You know, Chair Powell has also been worried about many of these other services components, the X shelter service, but they've actually been reasonably well behaved. I think the big thing to watch for in today's CPI report is going to be shelter, yep. in particular owner's equivalent rent. 
that has actually right. been the surprising stall out from progress. Totally agree. And it, it helped me here. Is it singularly pandemic multi film family build out and then oops, there's too many apartments? Well, there is. We, we do have a fair amount of supply coming online over the next year. But I think at the moment, we're all actually scratching our heads to figure out what exactly the CPI survey is measuring. You know, we you know, you talk to the apartment REITs or you look at some of the other big data and it does look like rents have slowed by more than what's showing up in the CPI. So I think we as well as Chair Powell are sort of sitting around wondering, like, when does this follow through from what's unfolding in multifamily really show up in the data? Tom, you know, Jonathan has got a very solid academic background. Started out really well at University of Connecticut. Then he gets his master's from the University of Chicago. But then it goes terribly downhill, Tom. He gets his PhD from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. It was, it was just a, terribly it, it downhill. It was a stumble. Yeah, I don't know what happened. There. He <laughs> missed my Duke. He's, yeah. By just like 10 miles, he missed Duke. Jonathan, 2% target for inflation for the Fed. I'm not sure why it's such a big deal. Help us think about that. I mean, why is the Fed focused on that 2% number? Well, I think they really just want to anchor expectations somewhere. And they, uh, you know, you know, back in 2012, you know, Chairman Bernanke and the committee thought that, um, you know, worried about what was unfolding post uh, GFC, <clears throat> you know, and they really thought pinning a number uh, very specifically like 2.0 would help solidify you know, for the public and for, you know, businesses, what the future, you know, sort of future level of inflation uh, should be and, and what they should think about incorporating into their decisions. And it was sort of deemed a relatively low and stable rate. Um, but I mean, I think inferring from your question, you're sort of wondering, like, 2.00, <laughs> do we really need to get there? Exactly. You know, which brings me to the question about the consumer, Jonathan. I mean, we kind of saw from Pepsi today uh, some weaker than expected numbers, particularly on just on the top line in volumes, maybe people trading down to, to cheaper uh, off-brand product names. How do you view the consumer out there today? Well, it's a tale of two consumers. I mean, if you look at the upper 20 percent of the income distribution, they're absolutely awash in cash, liquid assets and high levels of equity market wealth. Um, they're also benefiting a lot from, you know, the sticky elevated home prices in the existing home sales market. But if you look at the bottom two thirds of the income distribution, they're under substantial pressure. Um, you know, they're paying more yeah. of the net interest in the economy. They are their delinquency rates are rising. Uh, we're seeing, you know, over 10 percent of credit card accounts paying only minimum balances. Um, right. You know, it does really look like you've got, uh, you know, and it's not yeah. really the low end. I mean, it's seep it's right. seeping up through the middle. Um, but I think right. you've got a tale of two consumers and a big segment under a lot of pressure here. Uh, Jonathan Pingo, unfair question, but I can do it for a gentleman from Chapel Hill. And, and that is, can you link disinflation and a declining nominal GDP of some persuasion over to a diminished revenue growth in our corporations? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, this is I mean, this is something that, you know, I think we, we will probably see show up um, in earnings, if not this quarter in the coming quarter. I mean, you are seeing a slowdown um, in in nominal growth. You know, you're seeing pressure on the consumer. Um, I think one of the interesting things for the equity market, however, has been, you know, despite the slowdown we're seeing in the economy and the disinflation underway, um, you know, there's still several stocks that are really driving um, quite impressive returns here. John Pingle, thank you so much. With UBS, Jonathan Pingle, greatly appreciate it to get us started again. We'll have a lot more chat, uh, 90 minutes or less away here to the CPI report. The PPI tomorrow, yeah. frankly, is just as interesting. It is. I, I didn't say that a year ago. No. Two no. years ago. So we're looking for, again, you know, PPI, <clears throat> you know, X, food, energy, trade, all, year on year. You know, kind of two and a half percent kind yeah. of growth is kind of the expectation. A little bit higher than last month. Yeah. Futures negative six is a little red on the screen, but I don't want to over uh, sell it to you again. To me, the big adjustment here is the inflation adjusted 10 year yield. The 10 year real yield under two percent, one point nine nine percent. Technically, I need to see one point nine five percent to get me out of range. We're not there, but we are at the bottom 
of the recent range of the 10-year real yield. With our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom Paul. John, President Joe Biden's re-election campaign continues to face pressure for him to drop out. Bloomberg's Ed Baxter reports. Opposition as well as top leaders not showing confidence in his candidacy. Chuck Schumer reportedly told party donors in private that he would be open to a ticket without Biden at the top. Axios report. Senator Peter Welsh of Vermont has become the first sitting senator to directly endorse a replacement. Former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi stopped short of an endorsement saying Biden will do what he wants to do and there should be discussions next week. Outside, well, star fundraiser George Clooney said he had seen the same Biden two weeks ago that we all saw in the debate last week. Biden aides meet with senators today. I'm Ed Baxter, Bloomberg Radio. Meanwhile, President Biden will close out the NATO summit in Washington with a rare solo press conference this afternoon. Last night during his dinner toast, President Biden touted the alliance and a common belief in dignitary democracy and also for freedom. The dinner honoring the 75th anniversary of the Defense Alliance. The Department of Energy is offering $1.7 billion to car makers and suppliers to help them convert 11 plants to prepare for the move to electric vehicles. The funding would be scattered among 11 facilities considered by the administration to be at risk. It will be used to help convert assembly plants, parts plants, and even plants that make electric school buses. In soccer, Colombia beat Uruguay 1-0 and will face Lionel Messi in Argentina in the Copa America final. Then after the game, players from both teams pushed and shoved on the field at the final whistle. and Some Uruguay players went into the stands to scrap with fans. That always works out well. Global News, 24 hours a day, whenever you want it. With Bloomberg News Now, I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, John. And Michael Barr, thanks so much. We've got to set this up. David Gurr is scheduled. Is Gurr still scheduled to be with us? Did you talk to his people? people. Is he's, he? He's got people. He, he, he's, we think he's in the building, maybe? He is in the building. Okay. We've confirmed or that. Starbucks next door. We don't know yep, which. Exactly. Gurr, I'm going to set this up now because David is coming in. And you've got to talk about Biden and all that. Gura puts out comments from a Bloomberg News published story of Zaslev of Warner Brothers Discovery. Yep. This is David Zaslev yesterday. Quote, we just need an opportunity for deregulation so companies can consolidate and do what we need to do even better. Basically saying he doesn't care which party wins. No, and that's a terrible comment in my opinion. I mean, we need consolidation to shore up what are bad business models right here. Um, it's just, it's silly. I mean, the, the simple fact is the industry needs to figure out a way uh, to monetize right. and to make money off of streaming because that's where the world is going. Um, you know, bigger's better, but he he's already made a gajillion acquisitions. Is this because you have like a mocha chai whatever, exactly. chai whatever out, out there in Sun, Sun Valley? Valley and... I'll tell you, Sun Valley this time of year is spectacular. It's is unbelievable. It? Really? Yeah. It's just amazing. I'm and, surprised uh, Gur is not there. I know. He sh I'm yeah, surprised he's, he's not like a fed guest and out rested, there. You know. Exactly. So it's a, they, they get mm -hmm. all the media moguls out there. Now it's mostly a lot of tech folks out there these, these days. Um, Wait, it's a great place to I be. get it. Lisa Mateo from Hollywood up to Sun Valley. <laughs> Sun Valley, I can see that. Taking Clooney's golf stream. I, yeah, sure, I why not? It. Absolutely. Why not? David Girl will be with us here in a bit here on uh, th what's going on in Washington on this really, not to mince words, important day for America. Good morning.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker, the Bloomberg Newsroom, with this Bloomberg Business Flash. Let's just check the pre-market. Pfizer uh, among the most active shares. Right now, up over 2%. Pfizer moving forward with a weight loss pill. The drug maker trying to crack the multi-billion dollar market for obesity medications. This is also a once daily treatment and a pill. Uh, Delta shares down close to 10%. The airline expecting profit this quarter to fall short of Wall Street expectations. They blame heavy competition for driving down ticket prices. Uh, PepsiCo, that was down about 2%. The Dorito maker reporting weaker than expected revenue growth. They also have blame. Uh, they're blaming budget-focused shoppers in part. 8.30, of course, Wall Street time. Inflation report and Bloomberg Economics. Anna Wong expects June CPI to be a really good reading, to uh, kind of paraphrase Jay Powell. Uh, down futures right now, 66 points lower. It's down two tenths of a percent. S&P E-mini futures, they're down six. The Nasdaq futures, about uh, 16 points lower after yesterday's record closes for the Nasdaq and the S&P 500. And yields right now, two-year unchanged, 462. The 10 uh, unchanged also, 428. We check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker. That is your Bloomberg Business right. Flash Bulletin. Huh? John Tucker, thanks. Do you realize, Paul, that there's never been a Dorito in the Gura household? No. There's never been <laughs> no. a bag of a wise like, like double salted Doritos <laughs> or whatever. Joining us now, the host of The Big Take. Really timely, and every day recently it seems to be about Washington is David Gura. David, as you know, I was deep into the surveillance nap yesterday, and I woke up and not to mince words off the cell phone, the Washington world had changed. Review just for our international audience, what changed in Washington yesterday in the vicinity of 2 p.m.? Well, a renowned actor and longtime Democratic supporter came out saying that he thinks that Joe Biden should step down or not run for re-election. That's George Clooney. And then we had movement among the Senate as well. Pete Welch, the senator from Vermont, saying essentially the same thing in a Washington right. Post op-ed. So we've seen, I won't call it a snowball, but an escalation right. of members of Congress calling on this president to reckon with what's happening here, both uh, in his capacity to hold the job and also in what the polls right. are saying and, and think more seriously about when, when Nixon resigned, John Wayne didn't call him up and say resign. Or write an op-ed for How the New York Times, I think. How did we get to where, yeah. you know, full disclosure, I think Mr. Clooney's incredibly gifted, but, you know, when they say he's a celebrity, I don't buy it. He's not like a celebrity type. He's gifted. But how did we get to where Hollywood donors are telling the president of the United States? You know, just what as there to has do? been an, an erosion, I think, in support in the in the House and the Senate, we've seen it among the ranks of these big donors as well. And so we saw Rob Reiner coming out. These are people who give a lot of money to the Democratic Party. I mean, George Clooney in that op-ed outlining the fact that he was a huge backer of uh, President Biden last time. President Obama, the time before that, he has donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to these campaigns. And what he cites is this mega fundraiser that happened just a couple of weeks ago, just before that debate, uh, that was out in California, widely attended, raised a ton of money. And what Clooney says there is that you know, the Biden that he saw on stage at that event was the same Biden that he recognized in that debate as well. And I think there's a format to all of these op-eds, be they by lawmakers or celebrity donors, that is this acknowledgement of the fact that Joe Biden has had a long career in public service. He's done an awful lot. He was this kind of bridge president from Donald Trump to where we are now, uh, acknowledging all of his achievements, but again, remarking on the fact that uh, this, this isn't going the right way as, as they see it. And uh, David, I guess most Democrats would say, you know, I just want the person, the person who can best, has the best chance to beat Donald Trump. Is there any sense within the party who that person is? may be, whether it be President Biden or someone else? We have this short list of mostly governors who have been rumored to be likely prospects for this if it were to happen. Uh, we had a congressman from, from South Carolina saying there should be a sort of mini primary that takes place before the Democratic National Convention. We could hear from a number of these folks, be that Gretchen Whitmer or Gavin Newsom. Um, those are the names that are floated, J.B. Pritzker is, as well. Um, but no, there, there isn't one. And I think that's what gives a lot of, sort of the establishment right. pro-Biden supporters pause. What they always okay. say is that he's the one who has beat Donald Trump. Right. They're looking back as they look forward. It's Thursday. He's going to take a victory lap on NATO. There's going to be a press conference. And with your, with your experience, David Gura, holding court on Sundays at MSNBC, he has to get to the talk shows. How does Joe Biden get to Monday morning off of a press conference and two days later the Sunday gauntlet? 
This will be a very scrutinized press conference this afternoon, 5.30 p.m. in Washington at the Convention Center. It's something that he scheduled after that disastrous debate. So there's been a lot of build to this, a lot of anticipation. It's a solo press conference. He hasn't done one of those in a long while. He's done fewer press conferences than, than Ronald Reagan. Um, we'll see what carries over to Sunday, but it's safe to say that immediately after this, it'll be picked apart on cable news, in the newspapers, among those members of the House and Senate watching very carefully to see any signs but, of, of slippage. And then you say Monday morning, a big event is Monday afternoon as well. Right. He's sitting down with Lester Holt in Austin, Texas for another one of these primetime interviews and we'll see how he When is that? that? When's the Holt interview? Monday evening. It's supposed Monday. to be 15 minutes in length, no longer. Paul, Henrietta Trace yesterday was great. Perfect. She said, yep. they have it wrong. The public doesn't want him for another four years because of his medical condition. And it's the elites that are behind on this. Yep. That's what I don't think has been talked about. I think Trey's was exactly. profound yesterday. Vice President Harris, uh, Kamala Harris, we don't, we're not hearing much from her. I guess there's a, is her strategy just to sit in the background and see how this plays out? Seems to be her strategy. I mean, she's not doing interviews, but she is in North Carolina today. She's going to be doing an event in, in Greensboro. Uh, she's on the campaign trail. And so you see her, you see... Newsom and Whitmer and others kind of yeah. keeping their head down, doing these events, not creating a big stir. Uh, although, you know, I, I, you asked Tom about what happened yesterday. Of course, another signal moment was when the former House Speaker, House Speaker Emerita Nancy right. Pelosi, came out on Morning Joe and said basically that Joe Biden needs to make up, up his mind. And that scene is kind of her leaving the door open, perhaps encouraging members of the Democratic Party to speak their minds. She's very conscious of the fact that this could have significant effects down ballot on members of the House who are running for re-election. Yeah. So she wants them to be able to kind of speak their what, mind if they need to. From where you sit, what does Chicago look like, oh, David Gura? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at this point, I think that it's a real mess and it could get a lot messier. So if he goes ahead, remains the candidate, Joe Biden remains the candidate, there will still be those who are skeptical within the Democratic Party. And I think there will be uh, heated tension w within that convention in Chicago. Uh, obviously, if he steps aside, anoints a successor, it's a whole new ball game. Uh, there are those who say, this is an opportunity for the Democratic Party. You could pick somebody besides Joe Biden that would infuse the party with some excitement and we could maybe see that carry over in Chicago. But I think regardless, there is going to be this tension, it should be Biden or somebody else, and that'll be the crucible in which it plays out, Tom. New York Times, about a week ago, switched its position and really came out and said President Biden to step down. Uh, leading uh, you know, columnist Tom Friedman, for example, has been a longtime supporter of the president, said he should step down. How does that resonate with the Biden camp? Do we know whether they pay that much attention to mainstream media? We know that President Biden loves Tom Friedman, like he likes David Ignatius at the Washington Post. These are people he reads and respects. So no doubt it's wounding to him to see those comments in the New York Times and the Washington Post. But the Biden campaign has been using this very effectively to say, look, these are public pronouncements by elite columnists yeah, in a handful of they, newspapers. Who cares what they I, have I'm to say? I'm running out of time. David, you just said it, the Biden campaign. Uh -huh. Who's driving the bus? There are three campaign officials who are making their way to Capitol Hill today to sit down with Democratic senators to make their case for his continued candidacy. They are trying to drive the bus here, but I think that we have seen over these last 14 days, it's been two weeks since that debate, starts and stops, and one wonders the degree to which President Biden is driving this strategy going forward. Perhaps we'll hear more about that or today. Or his family? I mean, I don't want to get into the or gossip, his family, but that's of course. We but we know, we know that after this. that debate, he retreated to Camp David with his family. Yeah. They, of course, are planning I mean, to I mean, Paul, with, this is like at the Gura household when they <laughs> when discuss, I want Doritos, right? should we have Doritos? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have too many Doritos. But I actually the, had a bite the, of one. He's up on the roof picking his fiddle. I mean, yeah, but, but the well, the kids are holistic. Yeah. But <laughs> unlike at my house where I had a Dorito, and it's basically a bag of salt with some yeah. flour. Cool ranch or nacho it. cheese? What's your I preference? There's, I, it's like a fiery a thing mix, or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's just, it's like, it's not the Doritos we remember as kids. No, it's got a million different flavors, but a little bit of a weakness. There have there been chemical advancements since you're <laughs> yeah. you. oh, Very good. <laughs> Chemistry with David Gura. Folks, it's real simple. I'm the big take out on Apple Podcasts. Yep. Look for David Gura summarizing these historic events we're all living. And again, those events are this Thursday. Balance of Power will give you our best coverage. Joe Matthew and Kaylee Lines. Towards what time is the press conference, David? 5.30 p.m. 5.30 p.m. Wall Street time. So, Wall Street time. Wall Street. Excuse me. Excuse me. He's learning. Uh, yeah, we'll get there. We'll get, get the Kool-Aid out. Yeah. And it's not like to read. That's uh, 3.30 Sun Valley time. Yes. Oh, go. very good. Very David good. Gura, thank you so much. In one hour. The Inflation Report for the Nation. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.
Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash. Uh, Treasuries are now the 2 and 10 is pretty much unchanged as we wait for the CPI, 8.30 Wall Street time. Uh, traders uh, want reassurance. Cuts are on the way. Uh, contracts in the S&P 500, NASDAQ 100, little change. Uh, both of them gained more than 1%. Fresh all-time highs yesterday with NVIDIA and Apple leading the way. Uh, Fed Chair Powell telling Congress yesterday the central bank doesn't need inflation below 2% before cutting rates. Uh, Costco Wholesale climbing this morning at uh, more than 3%. They hiked the membership fee for the first time since 2017. PepsiCo slipping, reporting weaker than expected revenue. Uh, one of the standouts this morning, QuantumScape, never heard of it, but it's up 26%. Volkswagen's battery company, PowerCo, and QuantumScape announcing they've entered into an agreement to industrialize QuantumScape's next generation solid state lithium metal battery technology. It's a battery story. Dow futures down 78. The SP e mini Nailed futures it. down seven. Sometimes I need these interpretations. <laughs> NASDAQ futures right now down 17. But yes, it's a battery story. Batteries, Batteries are the. You know, uh, Paul told me to read The Grid, the book. And yes. my assessment from that is to stabilize the grid. The future batteries. So whoever it is, nails a, that is, yeah, you know, okay. going to get very rich. And the FT today with a lot of nickel, and that there's now a nickel glut off of Indonesia. And nickel is the battery users like Tesla yep. are not using nickel as much as they okay. expected. All right. so it all folds into uh, a truly a global scene. John Tucker, thank you uh, so much. Uh, this is a joy. Uh, FM Investments is the new, the modern way where fee-based people manage money. Alex Morse joins us now, CIO at FM Investments, Washington and Maryland uh, based. Thank you for joining us in our, our, our studios. The turmoil right now of seven stocks driving everything has to be insane for financial advisors. How are you adapting to the new world of the melt-up every day, as Edgar Denny calls it? It's, it's, it's hard. I mean, how do you come in when your neighbor says, well, I just bought NVIDIA and I made more money than you professionals? <laughs> and if we look at clients... Is there an anger? Is there an anger? There's a little bit, I mean, I'd say, but there's not... It's hard to argue. This is the way the market works, right? We, we built it this way. It's kind of our fault, right? It's our bed. Now we have to, to lay in it. There will be a retrenchment at, at some point. We know it's coming. But the easiest way to lose your job on Wall Street now is to be calling for that 30% correction and have been okay, for the so last two is, years. You, yeah. you, you say this perfectly. At FM Investments, with all the advisors you have and the way you've built out trillions of assets, literally trillions of assets, you've got to respond to the daily melt-up. What's the strategy to respond to that? You know, a lot of what, what I think we try to caution people against is that you can't fight the market. So if momentum is taking you some direction, there's nothing wrong with participating with it for a while. The time to buy insurance for that is either to stay out and to set your expectations accordingly, but not try to time the market, right? It's just not ever going to work. We hold names like NVIDIA, we hold them above risk levels, and it's not because we think that NVIDIA is going to be the biggest company in the world that it should be. It's we're here to generate positive returns for people as best we can. There will be a moment when there's a 10% correction in that name, and sadly, we're going to ride that down too. But that's what you pay for when you come along on the ride. The goal is, over the next decade, can we do that to beat a benchmark? So how do you think about asset allocation here, equities, bonds, alternatives? How do you look at that? You know, we've always been well, relatively well balanced. The problem is that just hasn't paid off as much as it should have. We're not deterred from it. We still think folks need to hold on to bonds. We, we're a big bond trader. We believe there's a lot of action to be had there, a lot of great capabilities. But it's tough some days when you look at the equity markets yesterday. Everything was green on the expectation that CPI is still above what expectation should be two years from now. Well, to clarify, now, Paul, continue. But to clarify, Wednesday was not like Tuesday or Monday. Mm, yep. There was a pop to yesterday that wasn't there earlier in the week. So. Let's just stay, stay with the equity markets here. I mean, do you 
are you kind of equal weight those big names or are you trying to find some value outside of the big six, seven, eight, nine names? So we, we've been trying to find value and we have. I mean, don't get me wrong. If you just bought the index, 16% midway through the year. It's, yep. not, it's not a bad year. I mean, no, historically, we'll 12% is what you're supposed to get over the course of the whole year. So we've got a little room for things to back up and still pretty average. Yep. It's just hard to find substantial value. You could find some names that have done pretty well, but you know, you can look at a Home Depot, you can look at some Costco, um, you know, things like that. But if the headline story is always going to be 30, 40 percent, I'm doubling my money every six, eight months. That's, that's just hard to beat for people. On the fixed income side, I mean, again, we finally, for the first time in 15 years, have yield out there. I mean, a two-year treasury, 4.6, 4.7%. .7%. Do I just stick my money there? That's no, that's no crime there. Or do I try to find take some credit risk? No crime at all. I mean, certainly if you want just the easiest yield, sit in T-bills. We yep. run TBIL. T-bill and chill has been what we're saying. and T-bill and chill. And still 5.3%. It's hard yep. to argue for rolling a 90-day you know, <clears throat> T-bill. That's what, you know, a, a good buddy of mine who was, right. who was a significantly big-time hedge fund trader, he's my ski buddy, we're sitting on a chair and he's like, I'm just rolling two month, three month T bills. He's been doing it for a couple of years. I'm like, wait a minute. Can Nick, I you're buy, a player. Wait, can I buy T bills from Treasury Direct or I have to go through you? You, you can try. Um, we encourage people to do that. It's it's a website built in I think nineteen ninety seven and hasn't <laughs> much changed since then, right? It replaced a phone system and prior to that the post office. Yeah. So it, it works. You can <laughs> I can see John Tucker <laughs> down in the mailing it, 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 if no, you're do ever, I need a broker to do that? No. no. If, if you're ever in Washington, the cash room of the Treasury is a really beautiful yeah. room. It wasn't used for that long. <laughs> this goes back to President Grant, I remember it clearly. But I can see John Tucker lined up at the, <laughs> the gorgeous <laughs> window of the cash room. <laughs> <laughs> Could I have a thousand dollars or twelve hundred dollars of those treasury bills? Tell me about the ETF revolution. You guys are in the heart of this. Fees are coming down. ETFs have way lower fees than the alternative. Is it an ETF future for America? I think so. I think it's a good thing, right? But I think folks miss the boat. They think ETF, they hear low fee, and they hear no taxes. And, and those are some nice features. But the really cool thing about ETFs, and two years ago, we didn't have any. We couldn't spell ETF. We sort of embarrassingly misspelled it on a few things from time to time. But it's that we learned they're a team sport. Right? All of us in the money management business, we're all actively trying to buy and sell the same things. But we ultimately need these brokers or all these parts uh, of the you know, capital markets infrastructure. ETFs put us all on the same side of the trade. So some of <coughs> our products, we get better execution, better pricing than we could deliver to our institutional clients by far, where usually it would be the larger clients who would say, I don't want ETFs, I want you to do all the work for me. They're the first to come to us now to say, stop doing all that work. Right. It's adding friction. Do it the easy way. What's the number one mistake mom and pop are making right now? High net worth. They, they, they come into FM, one of your advisor franchises. What's the number one mistake people are making? I think most folks are, are trying to run for the hills, right? They're too afraid like of- Like cash? Well, cash is okay as long as you're invested. No, in but it. is that what they want? They're comfortable in cash or T-bills or whatever? I think they're looking for private credit. They're looking for things they don't need to oh. do. They're happy to give up liquidity, which seems the absolute worst time to be doing that for what they think are more sustainable long. They, they look at returns today and say, that's going to go away next year. They've been saying that for two, three years. They've been wrong. Locking your money up for five, ten years on things that are overvalued, right? You should take a look at BREIT versus the NAREIT index and yeah. realize that it's not because the NAVs are wrong. It's because someone's setting one of those NAVs and the market's setting the other. And they're willing to give up cash today. Well, I'm going to make some news here. Are you predicting, and you've got alternative experience, Paul's been on this big time, but in private credit and particularly in private equity, is it going to be a long workout to get some form of liquidity valuation that's, a, that's reasonable? I think it's going to be a long workout, and I think it's going to end in tears for some folks who realize the numbers they've been seeing on statements for the last two, three, four, five years right. aren't really there. Okay. One final question, uh, really important. Where you're located, Orioles or Nationals? Nationals. Oh! I'm a trade-in, though, to D.C. This is an Orioles <laughs> studio. I'm, the Nationals. Yeah, we have a vested interest in it. We have a big uh -huh. vested interest. Yes. We're, we're very Orioles. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much with FM Investments uh, in the vicinity of Washington. Alex Morris, the CIO, FM uh, Investments. Thank God he didn't say the Tigers. With our news <laughs> in New York City, Michael Barr. Oh, my. Uh, President Joe Biden's reelection campaign continues to face pressure from him to drop out. 
Celebrity donor George Clooney said he should not run, and Democratic senators expressed fresh fear about his ability to beat Republican Donald Trump. Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut says whatever happens, Democrats need to be united behind the decision. There are advisors and supporters who may give him the kind of guidance that he is looking for, but I think ultimately it's his decision to make. Meanwhile, President Biden will close out the NATO summit in Washington with a rare solo press conference. Last night, during his dinner toast, President Biden touted the alliance and a common belief in dignity, democracy, and freedom. To NATO and to our neighborhood of nations, may we continue to grow stronger and closer in all the years ahead. Prosecutors sought to cast Alec Baldwin as someone who flouts rules and has little regard for safety at the first day of his New Mexico trial in the shooting of a cinematographer on the set of Rust. Baldwin's attorney told jurors that the actor did only what actors always do, act like the characters they're playing. He called the death an unspeakable tragedy but said Baldwin had committed no crime. Activists delivered a petition with more than 55,000 signatures to members of Congress demanding legislation that would allow workers nationwide to take paid time off for family or for medical reasons. The petition, organized by advocacy groups Paid Leave for All and Moms Rising, aims to create a permanent national paid leave program. Dawn Hucklebridge is the director of Paid Leave for All. We are one of only seven countries in the world that doesn't guarantee any form of of paid leave federally for its people, which means we are not just losing to other wealthy countries, we're losing to nearly everybody. Critics say paid leave requirements would force businesses to raise prices to pay for these benefits, likely passing on the extra costs to consumers. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr and this is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, John. Yeah, Michael Barr, thanks so much. Ian Lingen just re- uh, uh, memos here moments ago from BMO Capital Markets, a hyper detailed lengthy note on CPI uh, coming up. I'm not going to go into it because it'll take an hour to get through (laughs) Lingen's uh, brilliance. We're reminded that the departure point matters, and in the wake of last week's payroll update, yields are near the bottom of the range. And then it goes on uh, uh, from there. Uh, In the equity markets, Ed Yardeni with a note overnight, he said, I was wrong. You love it when Yardeni says he's wrong. You lean forward, the giant of C.J. Lawrence. He says, I was not optimistic enough. 5,600 to really? 5,800. Okay. And he's out with a six near 7% return for the next decade. Do you remember, Paul, in our youth yep. when Wall Street firms actually looked out three years? Yeah, you g- give it a routinely. shot. Routinely. Give it a shot. <laughs> routinely. Yeah. Everybody looked at three years. And I, I'll say with the great financial crisis, that went by the wayside. Yeah. They don't want to look out three weeks. No, it, of course not. It's tough <clears> out there. But I mean, I get, it seems like this strategist on Wall Street are just trying to play catch up here to what's happening in this market here. Again, uh, S&P 500 up 15, 16% this year. Uh, We see it across the street, uh, strategists raising their targets here. Uh, We're gonna go chasing, chasing, following, chasing. And the next data point is is earnings. We're we're starting to kick them out now. We got a couple of weak numbers out today from Delta and Pepsi, but again, the big banks tomorrow, but earnings will be front and center as well as the Fed. Uh, The the, the timeline on this for me, folks, and this is, I'm, I'm not mentioning names I should be mentioning, but Ben Laidler at HSBC, Christmas of 2018, just said shut up and buy. Mm-hmm. And then October two years ago, which I call the Yardeni Ankapura bottom, Ralph Ankapura, the great yeah, chartist, chartist and, yeah. at Yardeni. And there were others that said in October, November of 2022, get on board. And then what I didn't expect is it reaffirmed in October of 2023. Yeah, boy, off of that, off of that bottom, we're up yeah. well over 30% off that October 23 and, low. So. Well, the purview of this from the triple levers all cash yeah, fund exactly. is just killing it. And, and like Alex said, Paul, if you're not in this, you're going, what am I doing? Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, tough for these uh, managers that aren't long these big yeah. tech names. It's going to be interesting. The VIX, 12.57. Uh, Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg News with this Bloomberg Business Flash. Uh, waiting for the CPI. Bloomberg Economics says the June CPI report this morning looks to be another very good report. Should boost the, uh, the Fed's confidence about the inflation trajectory. Among some of the individual shares on the move this morning in pre-market trading, Pfizer, that was uh, up close to 2%. Moving forward with a new weight loss pill. Royal Bank of Canada is shuffling its leadership ranks. They're breaking its uh, biggest division into two. This is one of the biggest reorganizations of Dave McKay's decade-long tenure as CEO of RBC. Uh, Conagra, they make bird's eye, Slim Jims, Ready Whip, Classic Pickle, forecasting adjusted earnings per share. Uh, guidance missing the average analyst estimate. They blame inflation. And after a record close, S&P futures right now, Eight points lower. Dow futures down 81. The Nasdaq futures right now 16 points lower. And yields eh, unchanged. Two year 462. The 10 at 428. We check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Paul, Tom. And John Tucker, thanks so much. Well, Paul, this came up yesterday. Somebody said, you know, the sharks on Cape Cod are like real. And then, of course, down south, they're real, real. What about New Jersey? Are, Lots of like dolphins. Dolphins are all lots of dolphins. Yep. We also have the. I haven't seen any right whales, which are okay. pretty rare. But I see uh, lots of the bigger whales. Do you not see the sharks because they're little sharks? I mean, I don't know. No, I see uh, Australia, the surf. But... As a lot of people fishing, surf casting, they're always catching the small. I don't even uh, think, they're not dogfish, but they're smaller sharks. Okay. Yeah. Do they grow yeah. into big sharks? <laughs> yes, exactly. I, but you know. you're not sitting there with a beverage in your hand, you know, a Budweiser. No. Looking out, and lifeguards got the binoculars no, out looking no, for fins. No, they don't fins. do that seriously. They don't come. They don't. It's too <laughs> tough. They're not coming to Jersey waters. They know it's. Okay, these well, folks are tough in Jersey. It's your shark update, folks. Yeah. It's summer. <laughs> Now, a look at the front pages. What's making news around the world? Your daily roundup of today's headlines from major publications. Lisa Mateo, move aside. It's the front pages. Thank you, Interactive Brokers. And with us, John Tucker. It was brilliant yesterday, John. Do it again. Yeah, let's see if we can top that <clears throat> performance. Uh, from the Washington Post, NATO leaders move to Trump-proof the alliance at their meeting in Washington. Former President Trump um, well, he doesn't have a seat at the table, as NATO leaders gathered this week in Washington. He might as well. Officials are strategizing about how to adapt the alliance for the possibility that its most senior leader may soon again be a skeptic. The alliance policymakers, for instance, have moved control of major elements of military aid to Ukraine away from U.S. command to the NATO umbrella. They appointed a new NATO secretary general who's... Uh, He's got a reputation as being especially agile with Trump's unpredictable impulses toward NATO. Uh, they're also signing decade-long defense pledges with Ukraine to try to buffer military aid to Kyiv from the ups and downs of politics. They're pushing uh, up also their defense spending. That would be... Uh, yeah, that's the point. I mean, that's the I'm not single briefed biggest on this, anger but point. the former president's complaints actually worked, sure. right? Yeah. I mean, just to state, like as John just said, they're contributing more. Yeah, a certain percentage of their GDP. Um, I think Canada's behind, I'm guessing. I don't have it in front of me. But yeah, sorry. That's but good news. He complained, and they upped their... Right, John? That's the report? Uh, essentially. But in NATO's like, they're preparing for uh, the possibility that uh, Trump's going to become okay. uh, president again. Next? So what do you got? They're battening down the hatches. This is from the New York Post. I had to live through this period, okay. and it was crazy. Uh, Donald Trump's ex-wife. Speaking up, Which according one? to the Post, Marla Maples revealed in a rare interview she's willing to help the former president's 2024 nice. campaign, and she is even open to being his vice president. Oh, I'm ready, she says. I'm available if needed. I'm not sitting back anymore. Maples just turned 60. She actually was uh, talking to the Evening Standard in her first interview in eight years. The Post picked it wow. up. She says, I want to step out more share more and not be afraid of positive or negative <clears throat> outcomes that come from speaking out. Uh, they share daughter Tiffany Trump. Uh, the former couple's relationship had a controversial start since they met during a charity event in 1985. And God help me, I was actually there. The real estate mogul was still married <laughs> at that time to Ivana Trump. All right. 
Remember the fireworks. Okay. Uh, what else do you have? This is more back to reality. The Wall Street Journal, American workers have quit quitting their jobs, at least for now anyway. Numerous surveys show that fewer U.S. adults are currently seeking to leave their roles compared with job switching uh, frenzy over the pandemic years. Other data suggest job satisfaction is rising. And in interviews they conducted, formerly job hopping workers say they are now content with the balance that they struck at the positions they have. Uh, federal data show that those who are tempted to make a jump face, of course, a tightening job market and shrinking pay premium for switching jobs. So changing jobs. I don't, I, I, you know, yeah, I get it back and forth and all that, but I'm way more interested in the dynamic between full-time and part-time jobs. Yeah. And that's clearly gone, John, to your point, to more part-time job up versus full-time job up. Well, that yeah. that also might be uh, a conscious decision by people who just, you know, don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. Um, oh, let's finish with this one. This is actually an interesting story from Bloomberg Businessweek. Starting a rival to the Olympics. This is the biotech entrepreneur Christian Angermeyer. Uh, I think he's based in London, actually. He has a new venture. It's called the Enhanced Games, an alternative to the Olympics in which athletes will compete in 10 events from sprinting to weightlifting to an as yet undecided combat sport. Uh, except unlike the Olympics, these athletes will be proudly taking growth hormones, anabolic steroids, and other perf performance enhancing drugs. Uh, no data site has been determined for the competition yet. <laughs> Initial Jeez. funding was unveiled earlier this year, so they've uh, drawn close to $10 million in capital from Engemeyer's friend Peter Thiel and other investors. Why does this not surprise me? Um, <laughs> they also have critics. Kieran Perkins is an ex-Olympian who's now head of Australia Sport Commission. He says uh, simply of this whole venture, quote, somebody's going to die. <laughs> oh, great. So doped up athletes can win a million dollar prize for breaking world records. They're going to be paid also based on criteria, including the success of their social media posts about the games. Yeah, that sounds like a good I, I, The games to me, I'm fascinated if there's interest in the Paris games. I, think I, it's I, be, I just don't know. I think it's I, I don't have an Well, we did have a story earlier on the Bloomberg in which uh, the flights, if you're tracking flights from the U.S., it, uh, more people are interested in seeing Taylor Swift's concerts than they were the Olympics. The Olympics. I, I just, I, I, we jumped the shark on it. I don't know. I don't, know. I, I don't want I don't to be know. negative, and you know, I make jokes about swimming in the river. But I can just imagine the opening no. ceremonies are going to be just spectacular. One of the coolest oh, yeah. venues for these yeah. Olympics will be um, out of the Palace of Versailles. I think they're doing the dressage. Some of the, the dressage yeah. there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have team there. coverage. Katie Katherine Breifel. Breifel. <laughs> yep. Will be there. She's taking uh, Gus. Gus. <laughs> and yes, she's I competing. So or she's I, just. I don't know if she's she's competing or uh, competing or not, but I do know that Gus will swim the river <laughs> Seine. Exactly. They're taking Gus, and that's how he gets out to Versailles. Is he, Gus is the horse. He takes it's a Seine and then turns horse. left out. I don't know near Rouen yeah. or wherever I'm. Another place I'm not going. Well. Yeah. John Tucker, <laughs> thank you so much. The newspapers this morning with John uh, Tucker. Futures negative eight. We're getting to 30 minutes away from the CPI report. It's actually a big deal, but this is way different than the 30 days ago, Paul, because there's huge certitude that we will see disinflation. Yeah, it's 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 interesting, and I think the the Fed is obviously going to be looking at this uh, closely uh, because they're trying to get that inflation down. We heard from Fed Chairman Jay Powell over the last two days uh, testifying in front of Congress. Uh, feels like the labor market is softening uh, to the point where he may. Uh, that may be, yeah. have an impact on their, their decision. And now we'll just see about the prices, you know, Here price you stability and employment. In, in two seconds ago, Stephen Trent, Citigroup, we would treat share price dips in Delta as buying opportunities. Sure. That's buy the dip yep. is what we call that. Yeah, no problem there. I mean, again, the, the top line was solid. The uh, business uh, travel is up s double digits for Delta. So the right. top line of the business is, is good. Uh, they just got a lot of cost yeah. issues uh, running throughout the business. There was a soccer game yesterday. England, Netherlands. How about that? The killers are playing in London. And right as England wins, they put this, the game up behind them and play Mr. Brightside. Very cool. They timed it, I guess. Perfectly, yeah. The killings.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Why are we upset if we're creating jobs? Inflation is still a thing out there for the everyday consumer. With Lisa Mateo on markets. The economic calendar jam-packed today. And Michael Barr with news. Tensions between the U.S. and China have heated up even more. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. Paul Sweeney, Tom Keen, John Tucker in for Lisa Mateo. Michael Barr is dark in the door uh, this morning with a huge news day, particularly uh, in Washington in 29 minutes. A report on the nation and CPI. Ben Ammons publishes moments ago at FedWatch Advisors. Uh, let me quote directly for markets. The downside surprise is pivotal, yep. pivotal, I should say. Yeah, yeah. I can't talk, excuse me. Pivotal. <laughs> there it is. And the answer is that's in the price. Yeah, we'll see. Exactly right here, Tom. I mean, 8.30, uh, we're going to have it for you, CPI. Uh, the headline the headline is uh, CPI X Food and Energy, Tom, on a month-to-month -month basis, 0.2%. Uh, I like it on an annualized basis. That makes more sense to well, me. Thank you. Do you look month But McKee's telling me look month over I know. month. I know. He's, I'm looking year over year. Exactly. I'm old school. Because I like to talk about it. If you, somebody comes up to you at a cocktail party and asks about inflation, you're not going 0.2% month to month, are you? You're talking 3 No, I'm 3%, talking eggs at Whole Foods exactly. is what I'm talking. <laughs> what, what I would say, though, seriously, folks, is on the year over year CPI, if we get a two handle, 2.9%. Wow. That's psychologically a big deal. We'll see that in 28 minutes yep. uh, here as well. We are out on YouTube. I want to talk about this right now. You go to Bloomberg Podcast. Go to Google. Search YouTube Bloomberg Podcasts. And please sign up for Bloomberg Podcast. It's the heart and soul of what we're doing here right now. Nice growth there in the last number of months. And, of course, the live chat is very live. People talking right now about our, our military, our Navy, I should say, in the Pacific Smart chat out on live chat on YouTube, on Android uh, uh, Auto, and Apple CarPlay. Apple CarPlay uh, as well. Got a great set of guests. Michael Dart is scheduled to be with us. Michael Nathanson on the train wreck known as entertainment here <laughs> in the 9 o'clock hour. Futures at negative 8 from the Interactive Broker Studios of Bloomberg Business Flash, John Tucker. All right, Paul and Tom. Futures right now slightly lower. I'm going to call it mostly unchanged as uh, we wait for 8.30 on you know, the inflation report. S&P 500, the NASDAQ, that closed at records in yesterday's trading. Likes of NVIDIA and Apple are leading the way. Companies opening their books this morning. Let's start out with uh, Delta Airlines expecting profit this quarter fall short of estimates. Heavy competition driving ticket prices down, they say. Delta right now down uh, close to 9% in pre-market trading. And then you have PepsiCo reporting weaker than expected sales growth. The maker of Doritos and Mountain Dew uh, blaming persistent inflation hurting volumes in North America. Uh, news about Pfizer, New York-based Pfizer. Uh, they are on the move. Company says it's advanced development of a once daily weight loss pill. Those shares are up this morning 2.3%. I wanted to do this story because I think it's important because I keep getting almost every other month a notice from some uh, law firm about uh, a big uh, class action lawsuit against one of the healthcare providers right. because my information has been leaked out there. And online, that's invaluable information, knowing John Tucker's. Yeah, well, yeah. online trackers remain on the websites of the nation's largest healthcare companies. This is another aspect to this, often unknown to the patients. Websites operated by nine of the ten largest publicly traded health insurance, hospital, and lab companies had advertising and analytics trackers installed on user registration or login pages. Uh, this according to an analysis that was done by Bloomberg. So another aspect of this whole online thing. Dow futures right Cyber now, security. down 74. S&P futures, eight points lower. And that's your Bloomberg business flash. John Tucker, thanks so much. CPI here in 26 uh, minutes. We start strong with Gennady Goldberg, head of U.S. rate strategy, TD Securities. I'm going to go to the 10-year real yield. It's been range-bound since time began, since George Clooney's last movie. <laughs> and the answer is I looked this morning and I had a 199, almost a 198 on the 10-year yield for a cup of coffee, a cup of Sanka uh, this morning. Are we going to see ranges broken here in 25 minutes? I think we're probably going to see it continue to drift down. I don't know if you would consider it a broken range. I think we're heading down. My technical is a 195, and I can't get there. I just don't see enough movement. I think we'll get there over the next couple months. We're probably not going to get there after CPI. You know, as you guys were talking about earlier, everyone's expecting a weak number at this point. Yeah. That frightens me a little bit, because when everybody's on the same page, 
you know, you can get the upside surprise actually surprising everybody a little bit more than uh, it otherwise should. All right. So when you talk to your clients at TD Securities, how are they positioning them, themselves for not just today, but for the next several weeks, maybe for the remainder of this year? What are they doing? Pretty cautiously, to be honest. I mean, I, I think everyone's been burned over the last couple of years. Everyone's been trying to, you know, trade these kind of higher rates. Um, everyone's been trying to buy the dip. So, you know, rates lower. Um, mm -hmm. And it's gotten a lot of people burned, unfortunately. So everyone's waiting and watching, making sure that the Fed is actually starting to move rates lower before they're, they're coming in. Do you feel like the Fed is already behind the curve here that they should have, in fact, been raising rates already? I mean, lowering rates already? Ooh. Um, I don't think so. I okay. think they need the confirmation. I think that's the issue. I think today is only one out of, let's say, three inflation prints that they need to go in September. You know, September is more than 70% price at this point. I think it goes up okay. if today's number is lower, and then we actually continue to go. So I'm looking at the work function. Somebody somewhere back in time at Bloomberg created this work function, uh, world interest rate probability. And again, what function is it? How do you type it? W I R P. Oh, yeah, I remember That's this. That's a big one. But yeah. I don't know. It's, yeah. I've kind of lost. Oh, my it's way too complicated. I, I don't know Come what's on. going on there. It's, but again, we started the year at six rate cuts coming in. We got down to one or two here. What did the market kind of get wrong, do you think, in hindsight here? I think in hindsight, nobody saw that giant spike in inflation that came early in the year. Quarter, right? right, That first quarter inflation print. Now, we're still figuring out, is, was it seasonals? Was it some other factors? At the end of the day, you know, we don't move right. in, in linear trends. But the trend recently has been lower. And that's the, the important thing. I'm in the camp. It's European. It's a one-off, almost contractual lift in inflation because 1231 happens and a lot of people, auto insurance, whatever, put their rates up. Do you buy that story or not? I think there's a lot of year-end price changes. Um, Q1 is a huge quarter for that as well. Maybe the seasonals aren't taking a good accounting of that. I think what we're seeing in the last couple of months, though, is important, right? We're seeing a lot of key categories, OER and rents, insurance prices, right. really starting to actually slow right. down. And I think that's the key can part. I, can I ask a Bramo question? Sure. And I'm that's Lisa high Bramo. level. It's high level. level. I mean, I'm going to try here and get it right. Ian Lingen over at BMO Capital Markets is talking up. There's an auction after this. 30-year auction, whatever, I don't know. I don't know. Do the is. auctions matter now? Do they assist you in seeing where the vector's going? I think, you know, from a liquidity standpoint, these are really used by market participants to get in because liquidity right now is suffering. Um, from a signaling standpoint, it's a little bit tough because a lot of folks use these for liquidity. You know, I do think that a poor auction here could certainly get, get markets moving. Um, we're keen to see how much dealers take down, you know, what's the usage of dealer balance sheet, how much is actual demand? You know, we've got $2 trillion deficits in the, you know, in the pipeline as far as the eye can see, no matter who wins in the fall, right? That's the big problem here. So we are looking at those as kind of canaries in the coal mine. So far they've been okay, but that doesn't mean they're going to be okay going forward. Why is liquidity down? Is it the TD securities of the world not making markets <laughs> in these things? What's going on? Well, I wouldn't say that. Um, I think all the banks are trying to make markets as best they can. The problem is the amount of balance sheet available versus the deficits and the amount of outstanding debt. You know, the amount of outstanding debt has gone up trillions in the last couple of years. The amount of balance sheet, right, the amount of primary dealers hasn't gone up. The amount of balance sheet devoted to this product hasn't gone up. So we're reliant more and more and more on the actually the end buyers of fixed income securities to be present at these auctions. You know, so if dealers end up with, let's say, 50% of the auction, that's bad, right? That's got to be redistributed to somebody who can warehouse that for a long, long time. Oh, so that's what we should look at. That's one of the data points where we look at these, these auctions, because I have no idea why these auctions are important, so I just look to people like you or Ira Jersey at Bloomberg Intelligence. I don't tell get me it. it Grandma and I used to, she clawed my eyes out once on this. Yeah. <laughs> she thinks it's a big deal. I know. Like, yeah. I'll leave it to Lisa. Uh, what else should we be looking at for when we see this inflation prints today, tomorrow with the pr PPI? What are you going to be looking for? I'm going to be looking for what it means for PCE. Right. Okay. And if this translates into a softer PCE, specifically on a three-month annualized basis, right? If you look at where the Fed really pivoted dovishly back in December, it was when three-month annualized core personal consumption expenditure, PCE, was actually really plummeting. It looked like it was falling off a cliff. Right there, they pivoted dovishly. And then, of course, we had that Q1 acceleration and caught everybody flat-footed. We've been decelerating more and more and more. Now, for right, if our forecast for 0.18 pre-rounding is actually thanks. correct, then we should be seeing a further deceleration in that trend, and that's good news for the Fed. Okay, Gennady, thank you so much. Gennady yeah. Goldberg with us with uh, 
TD Securities uh, as well. Ruddy Green on the screen, small cap, giving me some green love with our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom, Paul, John. President Joe Biden is facing the prospect of more Democrats pulling their support for his reelection bid. Vermont's Peter Welsh is now the first Democratic senator to call for Biden to step away from the race. On the other side of the Capitol, Earl Blumenauer of Oregon is now the ninth House Democrat urging Biden to drop out. Meanwhile, President Biden managed to reassure NATO leaders about his fitness for office with a strong speech at the opening of the alliance's 75th anniversary. But was it enough to quiet growing doubts about his chances of winning November's U.S. election? Bloomberg government reporter Jack Fitzpatrick. The NATO summit was an interesting opportunity to look at uh, how people see the repercussions of this uncertainty. Uh, There were some good reviews of the president's speech at NATO, so that may have helped him. But at the same time, there are a number of foreign officials, NATO, EU and otherwise, uh, looking to meet with Trump. Bloomberg government reporter Jack Fitzpatrick. Biden will give a solo news conference this afternoon to wrap up the NATO summit in Washington. Testimony resumes today in Alec Baldwin's involuntary manslaughter trial. Baldwin is charged in the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins, who was killed during a rehearsal on the set of Rust when prosecutors say Baldwin fired a prop gun loaded with live ammunition. Prosecutor Erlinda Johnson questioned crime scene technician Marissa Popple, who was part of the investigation into the shooting and found live bullets at the movie set. How many rounds altogether did you discover that you thought were suspected live rounds on on the set of Rust? Uh, Five and the spent casing, so six in total. Baldwin's lawyer calling the deadly shooting a tragic accident, but arguing that Baldwin did not commit a crime, saying the actor never pulled the trigger. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, John. Michael Barr, thanks so much. Greifeld e- uh, emails in. Thank you for listening, Katie Greifeld. Of course, 9 a.m. She's, I think, with her team now. They're deep in meetings for the 9 a.m. television show. Oh, I know. Yeah, exactly. Interest and all that. Yep. God, I didn't know this. The, the, the horses fly on airplanes. No. It's, it's not like a movie. Well, how did you think they got there? On I don't ship or something. I don't know. You put on a And they, like a they have special <laughs> containers. Emirates Airways, you know, where all their, their horses leads with this. And you can fly with them. No. And you can get level. They get carrots. Yeah. And, you know, they get a movie. Oh, my goodness. And I didn't know this. There's people. It's like it's like, like a normal flight with people, grooms, and all that to help them out. And vets. And vets and all with that. With shots in case the horses get nutty on the plane. Yeah, but they be optimistic here. Come on, it's Gus. And the answer is Gus flies, you know, in style. Yeah. He goes into right. CDG. Well, they're Olympic athletes. Gets out. Yep. <laughs> they watch National Velvet. They're right, exactly. Know, they just play one movie all day. <laughs> loop it, Katie loop Greifeld uh, with Gus at the Olympics. Well, she's got team coverage here. We'll yep, have that exactly. out uh, near Versailles um, as well. This is exciting. We're 12 minutes away. I'm going to steal your thunder here, Paul. Stephanie Roth with us. It's going to yep. be great. Yep. I mean, she has an I'll opinion. You, you know, Wolf Research is one of the great people. success it stories yes. on Wall Street. You get these guys, after the great financial crisis, they left Wall Street for a variety of reasons, set mm. up their own shop. 99% of them did not make it. Wolf Research made it. Ed Wolf and has been, created an yeah. amazing business there. Yeah. It's really cool. We're a little red on the screen here off of Pepsi Delta <clears throat> in earnings as well. The VIX 12.97 from New York. Bloomberg Surveillance.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash as we wait for 8.30 and the inflation data. Futures right now kind of unchanged. Uh, S&P E-mini futures, nine points lower. That's down about a tenth of a percent after yesterday's rise of 1% at a new record high. Uh, NASDAQ futures right now, 22 points lower. The Dow futures, they are down 77. Yields right now, the more policy reactive two-year yield is up two basis points. Uh, right now at 464, the 10 year unchanged, that is at 429. Uh, PepsiCo reporting weaker than expected sales growth. Maker of Doritos, Mountain Dew says persistent inflation hurt the volumes in North America. And I actually want to do this one because I haven't seen these, I don't know, in how many years, but they still have those red kiosks for DVD rentals in the supermarkets. Uh, but now it looks like the end, bankrupt owner of Redbox Entertainment going to be liquidated. Uh, lawyers for the company and lenders accused its former CEO of uh, mismanaging the business, you think? So goodbye to those well, DVD rentals. there is someone in the Bloomberg television world today, yeah. and I will not throw that person under the bus, that up until recently had DVDs mailing them back and forth in those little envelopes <laughs> in the Bloomberg mailroom. I you mean, up until six months that? ago. Up until about yeah, six months Red ago. Yeah, Redbox, those things, but... That's, no, this I, was, this was the, uh, the Netflix. They were still doing Netflix DVDs. A but Netflix doesn't do that anymore. They, they don't, do. right. So up until recently, they did, though. And on air, this person is as we speak. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> laying on. it out there. I will Come not, on. I will Who not is name it? names. Paul Sweeney, <laughs> John Tucker, uh, thank you. Uh, so much. We're 10, uh, 10, 12 minutes away from this inflation report, and we have an important brief. Stephanie uh, Roth joining us right now uh, from uh, Wolf Research. We are commercial free here through the inflation okay. report into the later part of the hour. Thank you so much for joining. I want to go to your physics, into your mathematics at Bucknell ages ago. Does that? You were 17 years old or whatever, and you had to figure out what a vector was in the Cartesian <laughs> space. What does the disinflation vector look like? like right now what's its character right now we're seeing this disinflation trend i mean i have to say it's probably going to be less disinflationary than what we saw last month there was a couple of one-off so things. will this be a disappointment no i don't think it should be a disappointment i think expectations are set for this last last month there was a significant surprise for some areas like motor vehicle insurance which came in significantly softer than expected so on the services side you might see a little bit of a bounce back but it should li look like a core cpi that rounds to 0.2 percent which would then put core pce something below 0.19 percent which is what they're looking for to be able to cut in september okay so this cpi goes into the core pce i'm getting all these nomenclatures here these but that's what the Fed really focuses on, right? Exactly. So core PCE, core CPI is what comes out first, right? So that's why the market's completely okay. focused on it. Got but it. core PCE is what matters when you're really thinking about the Fed's numbers and their projections and, and what they're going to be officially targeting, which is an you know, inflation rate of averaging about 2%. So September rate cut, totally on the table now, right? Totally on the table. And I have to say the softness that we've seen recently in the employment data make it even more likely. Okay. The core, the core CPI data is it confirmed by the 47 other inflation series that each an individual Fed has: the Dallas Trib mean, the three means at Atlanta, the two means at Cleveland, et cetera. Are those others corroborating a disinflation? Yeah, they're all consistently showing the disinflation. And what I have to say is, at the beginning of the year, it just really, truly looked seasonal. And they didn't want to lean on it for good reason. Okay, because fine. they have been wrong. It's not the beginning of the year. It's July. Did he allude in his testimony the other day that it's July and he can move on? Yeah, that's, I think that's totally fair. And now we've, we've certainly passed that. The last couple of prints have been good. And now it real, the, the focus might be on employment because inflation is consistent with the disinflationary trends that, that we're all looking for. Talk to us about this labor market. I know it's softening, but is it still strong, full, full employment, more or less? Yeah, I would say it's softening, but it's not weak, right? Okay. Like, that's what we saw in, in the latest print. I mean, the headline number was a big one. You did get downward revisions. You're starting to see the rise in the unemployment rate, but some of, it's, some of that's driven by supply. And, it's, and an increase in supply is driving some is of that, that unemployment. Is immigration? Partially, exactly. Partially immigration, partially people being drawn into the labor force. The new entrance into to the labor market has been driving a lot of that. So it's not necessarily such a bad thing, but it's certainly putting some additional downward pressure on the labor market, which is helping to bring down wage inflation. GDP, where are we in GDP in, in this year versus maybe next year? 
So we're looking for something like trend-like growth, something around 2% for GDP. There was a risk that it could have been above trend. I think that's what the markets were worried about in the beginning part of the year. Okay. And that doesn't appear to be the case, which is kind of a good thing because we, the economy needs to rebalance. Next year should also be something like trend-like growth, something around 2%. I'm right. worried in 2026 if we end up getting tariffs, that could be a significant downward pressure on, on talk, GDP. Talk tariffs. about real estate in a general sense because we know here it's absolutely insane. And yet for huge swaths of the MSA America, there are met MSAs where there seems to be rents are really declining. Do you buy it? Yeah, and that's what, that's what the real-time data are showing. And that's what, that's what we might actually see Will in today's print. Will that be in print. the data here in nine minutes? I think, today, I think this is going to be the first print where o owner's equivalent rent, OER, should actually see a step down. So this, this, should be, this has been long awaited. Everyone's been watching for OER to finally come back down. And this could probably be the month for two reasons. One, the seasonals go the other way, so it should put some downward pressure. And then there were some funky things with the, the metro areas in, the, late, in the, the prior print, and that should also reverse. So this might actually see, be the first month where we see owner's equivalent rent take a, another leg to back down. How about the U.S. consumer here? I mean, we, we look at inflation moderating. Most consumers have a job. Wages are increasing. Talk just about the U.S. consumer. Is, is it two different kind of consumers out there? How do you think about it? You're definitely seeing some vulnerabilities at the lower end. That's been the case for quite some time. At the, at the upper end, it still seems to be okay. Like you said, the people, as long as people are employed, the consumer should be okay. You have seen a deceleration from, from a goods perspective. My base case is that when the Fed is able to cut <coughs> interest rates, those durable goods type categories, the ones that are most interest rate sensitive, should be able to, to recover to some extent. But it has been a soft patch for the consumer, and I think that started to, to spook some folks, and one reason right. why the Fed is more likely to cut in September. One final question as well on the, on the cutting in September. Is that in the market? I mean, with the melt-up that we're seeing, Ed Yardeni goes to 5,800 SPX today, hugely optimistic out four or five years. So is the, is the, the Fed action to come in the stock market now? Here, yes, I think that's in the market. The one thing that's maybe not yet priced Please. is the fact that we're more the, the market's likely to price in three cuts rather than one cut. If we're gonna if we're gonna see the market move in a certain direction, okay. it's more likely to price in more cuts. Even though base case right. for me is still two cuts, it's possible we'll just move a little bit in that direction before swing, swinging swinging. Hugely back. valuable. Yep. Thank you awesome. so much, Stephanie Roth. Thank you so much with Wolf at Research. Governor Krosner will join us here in a bit in about 10, 15, oh, 10, 12 minutes. Randall Krosner of the Booth School, Chicago. But now we go to Michigan academics, and it can only be Claudia Sam joins us right now, of course, with all of her work, and it's on the real economy, and I'm not going to ask her about the Sam report and that. I'm going to ask her, and this is so important, folks, because I got an immense respect for the combine at Michigan that invented modern inflation study. Claudia, when, when Shapiro and the crew out at Michigan invented all these ways to measure inflation, which is the Michigan approach or the Cleveland Fed approach you use the most? So respect the data and use every piece of data you can. I mean, that's the part that comes at Michigan that's in the part of the training at the board and you see it throughout the Fed. There's a reason that you don't want to get too wedded to one particular measure right. of inflation and look under the hood. So that's a big piece. Now, of course, then it takes the judgment to look at all those pieces and roll it all up and tell a story. Right, like you have to know the data well enough to be able to tell the story. Can you tell a story with the way we calculate housing, shelter, rent prices? I mean, we look at the inflation of a dozen eggs and I think we measure it. Do we really measure rents and housing correctly? We need to be very careful about what the question is that we're trying to answer. So if we want to know what, what's the cost of living right now, what's housing, what are what's people paying, the way the CPI does it to look at all these contracts makes total sense, right? Because it's looking at all the different new renters, people who've been there for a while. If you're thinking about what is it the price the Fed should be reacting to, what is it that's right happening now, then looking to prices for new rent contracts is very important. And that has been a disconnect and a challenge for the Fed is that you've had these new rent price contracts for almost two years have gotten back to normal inflation. And yet the total shelter, all of that is still elevated. And so you gotta, you gotta ask the right question and then go find the measurements that you need. And it, it makes it complicated right now because they're disconnected. So Claudia, um, how is this Federal Reserve gonna 
If we get a print that's more or less in line with the consensus, how do you think this Federal Reserve is going to read that? They'll be relieved. <laughs> uh, in the, the, the Federal Reserve, outside of a crisis, and we are not in a crisis, is a very slow-moving object. It wants to work by consensus, and it is very clear having looked at, you know, the Fed speak we've gotten from all the different officials, the summary of projections, that there's a lot of disagreement. There's a healthy amount, of, the disagreement is healthy, and yet if they want to pivot and start to begin cutting rates, their need, j Powell needs time to build a consensus, and they've made clear they need data, so he needs the data on his side to build it, and that's where you need to have a string of good prints with some lead time to September so that they right. can get everything together. Paul, get one more in here before the report. Yeah, exactly right. So, Claudia here, what's your view of inflation here? Has the Fed gotten its handle on inflation here? It's hard to say. I, to me, the, the focusing so much on the data and, and getting very cautious, like the trend is clear. It is very clear where we are headed. We are headed back to 2%. It's <laughs> it is risky not to right. put policy and get the outlook going. And they, they haven't moved off that real data dependence in a way right. that I'm still concerned will cause problems. Well, quickly here, Claudia, parse this, because you just hit the heart of the matter. Are we getting back to a John Williams 2.0% what we had before 2020? Or is it going to be a new kind of 2.x% percent? I put my weight more on the side of John Williams. The bar is high for big, big change. I love this. I mean, you have to have big institutional <laughs> change. And yet, and, and yet I don't think we're coming out of this exactly as we went right. into the crisis. What we're going to do is we're going to continue with Dr. Sam. We are privileged today in Bloomberg Surveillance to have Claudia Sam with us, and then Randall Krosner will join us uh, after we digest the data with Dr. Sam. Krosner, of course, of the Booth School of Chicago, a former governor. Of the, of the Federal Reserve. We, act, we welcome all of you on Android Auto, on Apple CarPlay. Particularly, we welcome you on YouTube. It is our oh, yeah. new distribution. It's a modern thing. And actually, <laughs> in the media world, Paul, YouTube's getting a lot of write-up yep. about the mystery of it. Yeah, Laura the Martin, Laura Martin uh, a top media analyst out on Wall Street at Needham, uh, uh, out yesterday with the research and <clears throat> putting the value of that asset within yeah. the Google family, maybe 450 Billion well, that was Lisa dollars. Mateo putting it over the top. Exactly, you know, I mean, of course, with her a, newspaper a segment, of course. So let's review the CPI data. Paul and I both agree year over year. McKee goes to month over uh, month. To me, the key number, CPI year over year, 3.1%. Could you imagine a 2.9%? Yeah that, uh, yeah, that would be interesting. To me, that would be... That would get your attention. That's what I'm watching. Okay. What are you watching, Paul? I mean, I'm, you know, again, X food and energy here, the core 3.4% um, interesting as well. Even so ticked down here. Yeah, mm -hmm. and exactly. So we'll see how this comes out. But again, most folks feel like this Fed has got its <clears throat> handle on this inflation rate. The prices are still too high for consumers. We get that. But what the Fed can focus on is that rate of uh, yeah. month over month and year over year inflation. And of course, we have claims as well. Paul with Stephanie Roth asking, yep. is it a fully employed America? We welcome all of you across the nation to a look at the CPI report. Claims are constructive and do better. And what we see now with uh, so much of inflation is it comes in decidedly in a disinflationary uh, mode. You're going to see a huge move, I would predict, in the market. Yep. Equities uh, lift here. I'm looking at the 10-year real yield. Claudia Sam would want me to do it. It plunges out of the recent range and moves from 1.99 down to a stunning 1.90, a full wow. 10 basis point wow. move. Paul, go through the list of the inflation. You do it better than me. CPI, Tom, just right off the headline uh, is There's negative. a negative symbol. There's a negative symbol. Let's call that out. 0.1%. Tom, the consensus was a positive 0.1%. Uh, so it's lower than the consensus. It's lower than last month. That gets your attention. Uh, X food and energy, 0.1% uh, versus a consensus of 0.2%. So you put that all in for the annualized number, Tom. Uh, CPI, X food and energy year on year came in at 3.3%. The consensus was 3.4%. And that was what it was last month. So a, a slower inflationary environment is what we're seeing here, Tom. Average wages is pretty much a level as well, maybe a little bit of an improvement in weekly earnings. And I would finally state the claims reversed from the recent trend 
to a, I'm, this is, this is, Claudia is going to be really impressive. I know. Worser claims. <laughs> How about that? It's a better claims statistic, but it's just one data point. On this market moving CPI report, futures up eight, NASDAQ up two tenths of a percent. The 10 year real yield craters from a 199 to 1.91%. We win with Claudia Sam. Claudia, there's a negative sign on CPI month over month. What does that signal? It's good. I mean, this is the, what's so important about getting these kind of numbers at this point is it goes back, it tells us what we saw the second half of last year, what wasn't supposed to happen, the disinflation without the pain, that was real. And it also tells us a lot of that, where we got stuck up at the beginning of this year, that was, that was not the right signal. Right. So, this, you know, we get one more month of data, but it actually helps us sort out the different conflicting stories that we've had before that, you know, we, we are on this disinflation path and we have been. And this is this is very good news. It is one data point and you don't you know, it's nice to see a negative ahead of that number. We shouldn't get too, you know, wound up about it. But but this is the disinflation story. It's here and it has been here. We've just it's been under the hood and been hidden. So uh, how do you think the Fed is going to interpret interpret this data, Claudia? Are they going to look at it on a, a month basis or kind of a maybe a three-month, six-month trailing basis? How do they look at some of this CPI data? We, we now have three months that are good months, right? And, and frankly, this is, this is another very good month as with the last one. So again, they're not going to want to, you know, overreact to one month. <clears throat> But, but we're getting in their three month moving average range of these are good numbers. We need to keep them going. We had a whole string of uh, disinflation right. in the second half of last year. The composition, we're all talking about top line numbers. And what's right. going on under the hood is important. And, yet, you know, good news is good news here. And it is a story. It re, it re Right. enforces the disinflation story, which is what we need to get back to normal. The market moves, futures explode up 16, Dow futures up 78, NASDAQ up three tenths of a percent, small caps almost up 2%, the VIX a much more attractive number, 12.33. Bloomberg surveillance across the nation with a stunning inflation report, and we are strong with Claudia Sum, of course, of Michigan for yep. years, wow. and affiliated with the University of Chicago Booth School. The former governor of the Federal Reserve System, Randall Krosner, joins us now. The market economist, Randy Krosner, Neil Dutta of Renaissance Macro, puts out a blistering single sentence. The doves have what they need. It is time to cut. What will the PhDs at the Eccles Building advise Chairman Powell? Uh, they will say that uh, we have the foundation for a cut, but they're not going to be ready to go yet. Uh, so I think they're going to, as, as Jay has said over and over again, he needs more data to feel confident that inflation is coming down in a sustained and sustainable way. This is certainly consistent with that. And you could see from the testimony that he gave over the last couple of days, he was talking more about the uh, the risks to the downside. Yeah. That is the risks that the Fed holds <clears throat> rates too long and uh, the, uh, the economy, in particular the labor market, slows too much. This is not enough to get them to move at the end of this month. I don't really think that's um, right. that's going to happen. But I do think it sets the foundation for a move in September. Right. Tough question, Randy. I'm going to ask it with your brilliance and particularly in financial economics. People will say the elites are benefited by our Fed policy because they are asset heavy, price up, yield down, assets do better. When you're around the table at the Eccles Building, July 31 or into September, is there any discussion of the partition of America where so many Americans need that rate cut now? Well, certainly the uh, the Fed has been very much focused on, on the labor market. I mean, think back to a few years ago uh, when Jay Powell and the rest of the Fed launched the average inflation targeting, where they said, well, we could run the economy too hot for a little while and that would be okay. Um, so they, they are very sensitive to that. That is, I think, why Jay is starting to speak so much more about that. The unemployment rate has been 4% or below for a very long time now. That's a very strong labor market, and there has been a lot of generation of jobs, not just at the high end, but really throughout the entirety of the, uh, uh, of the income, uh, income distribution. But they're sensitive to that, and I think that will lead them to, uh, to cut by September, but not this month. 
So, Randy, when the Fed does begin to cut rates, how do they do it? Do they do it, you know, four, five, six meetings in a row? Do they alternate? Yeah. How does that work? And, Paul, your question is the absolute heart of the matter. Sure, for sure. And so I don't think they know yet how they, they want to do it. I don't think they you remember there's that uh, old phrase that uh, that Alan Greenspan had that you move at a pace that was likely to be measured. So 25 basis points every meeting for like two years. Okay. I don't think they want to do something like that. See, Randy, um, you're, so you're, you're busting my chops with this. Paul asked the money question here. But Randy, we are wedded to a Greenspanian mathematics on this. Are we wrong to do that? I mean, should we be more creative about it? Back to McChesney Martin or Arthur Burns? Should we have a new formula forward beside a, a measured Greenspan? Yeah, I don't think they're going to do the measured pace. I think uh, there's pretty pretty clear consensus, even when I was, was there, uh, which is now a while ago, uh, that uh, measured pace was not the best way to, uh, to to do things. And so I think that they will move. And, and you can see when they moved inflation, interest rates up, that was not at a measured pace. That was pretty rapid. Uh, so I think they're going to they'll bring interest rates down. I think they'll bring them down somewhat gradually at first. But if they see the labor market really weakening, they'll start to move quickly. That'll be too late to to prevent the labor market from softening substantially. But they have to weigh the risks of calling all all clear too early getting back into what happened in the late 70s early 80s where they did that and then inflation reignited and they had to raise rates really high got a really bad recession they'd rather wait a little bit you know perhaps a little bit too long to buy some insurance against that uh, that upside uh, inflation scenario uh, but then they can cut and uh, just have a, a slowdown maybe a mild recession but something that'd be much less worse uh, than um, what they had in the uh, the early 80s all right, Randy, so today's inflation, David, you know, certainly showing some slowing inflation. We heard from Fed Chairman Jay Powell over the last two days uh, speaking in front of Congress, focusing, I think, a lot of investors said, boy, he's really kind of focused on the labor market, the employment market, and citing some slowdowns there, or just some softness there. How do you think about the labor market? How do you think the Federal Reserve thinks about the labor market? So I think they, they see that, I think, is really the key um, on both the demand side as well as on the supply side. So on the supply side, they look a lot at wage growth, and wage growth has been coming down um, a bit. It's still uh, now 3.9 percent rather than 4.1 percent, substantially above their inflation target. And given how important wages are in the cost structure of both, well, certainly services firms, but even manufacturing firms, um, unless productivity really spikes up, that's going to have to come down uh, a little right. bit, a little bit more. On the demand side, obviously, um, when there's good real wage growth, as there has been, that is that wages have been growing fast, and nominal wages have been growing faster than inflation. That's a big, uh, right. that's a big plus for households continuing demand, and they want to keep that balance just right. Professor Krasner, stay with us. Don't go away. Uh, at the Booth School uh, Chicago with his great work at opening Booth School in London here a number of years ago, Randall Krasner, the former governor of the Fed. Kate Moore of BlackRock scheduled to be with us here in a number of minutes. We come to you commercial free across America, around the world to a true disinflationary report. A negative statistic on one of the items was the real shock to me. Futures explode up 16 after the big move up yesterday. Do you think it was pre-release, Paul? You think somebody knew something yesterday? I don't I'm know. I'm trying to make a, a exactly, plot here. Exactly. Croster's going to hang up if I if I say they knew ahead of time. Uh, the VIX 12.53, the 10-year real yield plunged really out of range, went down to 1.90, comes back a little bit, but in a 1.95, critically, in a lower range. Let's stay with Randall Crosner here, a boost school, and then uh, Paul will bring in Kate Moore here in a bit. Randy, we're learning so much, and what I learned was from David Rosenberg at Merrill Lynch a million years ago, that the financial media focuses on one statistic, or maybe we get sophisticated, and we look at three statistics. Pros like you, and Kate Moore for that matter, look at 47 or 55 inflation <laughs> statistics. Which is the one you're looking at right now? What is the subset of data that matters to Randall Krosner? And it's not really the CPI. It's the uh, the personal consumption expenditure index, the the PCE that comes out with the um, uh, with the GDP report. That's what the Fed has said that they really focus right. on. 
think that's reasonable because if you look at the weightings in the CPI, a, a very large fraction of it is around rents. And so, um, you know, some of the oddities <coughs> that we, we get with rents, whether it's, you know, last month there's a big spike up in New York City rents. Um, there's a big lag in the way that rents are um, uh, come into right. well, its owner occupied housing, but it's really rental numbers that, that come in that sort of lag things. Because, as you know, people send, usually sign one year contracts for rents. And so we're finding out a lot about what happened last year rather than what, what's happening, uh, ha happening currently. Less of a weight on that in the, uh, uh, in the PCE index. And so the Fed really focuses right. more on that. And I think that's reasonable to do. Okay, Randy, this is really important. And I mean, you know, Brown University economics, Paul, it's a little different than Harvard undergraduate economics. The, the gentleman at Harvard, Jason Furman, I think you know who he is, Randall Cross. Oh, yes. Jason Furman of X10 fame launches a tweet out moments ago, amazing inflation data for June. What's exclamation points? They do that at Harvard. Yeah. Brown University <laughs> pool said no exclamation points no. ever. Come on, Randy, the Fed's got to adjust to this report. Explain how they adjust as they stagger to July 31st. So certainly they will take this on board. And uh, and I think, as you can see from the minutes uh, uh, that, that I think are reflected in some of uh, Jay's recent testimony, there's a lot more concern about the potential downsides and uh, the risks of keeping <clears throat> interest rates uh, high for too long. Right. They will take that on, on board. And I think what they will do is, I don't think they're going to move, but I think what right. they're going to do is, lay the foundation for move in September because in some sense Jay laid the foundation for changing the wording and changing the um, uh, changing the the press conference uh, feeling in July and because the move the, the Fed in its communication moves at a pace that is likely to be gradual and uh, and so they lay the foundation for changing the wording in July to be able to lay the foundation for actually making a change in September. So I think that's what you're, right. you're most likely to hear. Randy, thank you so much. And just for the record, Professor Krosner, I would kill to get Professor Krosner and Professor Furman on oh, at the yeah. same time. Yep. That's a giant in financial economics and a giant in policy economics. Yep. Randy Krosner, The Boost School, thank you so much. Futures up 11. All right, very good. Uh, from economics to these markets, in a day when we've got uh, CPI coming in a little bit softer than expected. Maybe that's good for the folks that are watching the Fed. Maybe uh, some more ammunition to cut rates. The S&P futures up two-tenths of 1%. NASDAQ up a quarter of 1%. Uh, let's go to those markets right now. Kate Moore, she's head of thematic strategy and global allocation at a little firm called BlackRock. So, Kate, uh, I'd love to get your thoughts here on this inflation print we saw this morning. What does it mean for you? Look, I think this is the, the latest in a string of good news for the equity market. You know, one of the things I was uh, really considering as we finished off the second quarter was that, you know, most people were skeptical about the sustainability of the equity market going into the second half of the year. They're a little anxious that we can't repeat returns. I think this message that we're getting now that the Fed is going to be in a place where they can continue to or they can start to ease policy and continue to guide us. That, that is the path into the beginning of 2025. Um, is going to be quite supportive for equity markets. But it's not the whole story, right? I mean, lower rates are uh, certainly a support, but that's not what's really driving the equity markets in 2024. It's really been an earnings and a fundamental story. So now, us equity investors, we have to turn our attention to earnings, which are kicking off any moment. So what do you expect to see here? We had some of the uh, numbers today. Delta, uh, a little bit weaker than expected on, on some costs. Uh, Pepsi a little bit weaker on some top line there. What are your expectations here for earnings this cycle? Yeah, so okay, let's get out of this uh, to begin with. The baseline consensus is looking for a seven and a half to eight percent EPS growth for the second quarter. That's obviously a little bit of an acceleration from the first quarter. So this is what I'm talking about between the price moves and uh, where consensus is from bottom up basis. You know, we're kind of at a hot place. Um, but I will say, as much as people are anxious about a pullback and you know get worried that multiples have expanded, there are a couple reasons I think this earnings season could meet these high expectations. So first, I'm going to make this point around pre-announcements because I watch this really closely. When you're going into earnings season, people may put out all the bad news that they need to early, 
Um, and there have been very few negative pre-announcements this quarter, especially relative to what we got in the first quarter of 24, which was still a good earnings quarter. So uh, no one is coming out trying to front run the market here and, and, and get the bad news out before earnings, which I think is actually a, a very positive right. signal. Kate, and then the second thing. Oh, please yeah, go, go ahead. Now continue. Kate, Kate Moore, you deserve a second thing. Give us a second <laughs> thing. The second thing I was going to say is uh, earnings revision ratios. This is like the ratio of upgrades to downgrades uh, uh, from the bottom-up analysts. And over the last one month, the earnings revision ratios for the U.S. and particularly for the biggest parts that matter, like tech, have been very positive. We have in tech, we've had more than two upgrades for every one downgrade. And you know that's not a sign going into earnings season that right. people are seeing any signs of weakness. Ira Jersey is going to be with us in a bit. We're still with Kate Moore BlackRock and Mr. Jersey and his team. I mean, Kate, it's not like you or you're, you know, you're alone and you're understaffed. Jersey's got like seven people right now writing and working on the moment. And Ira's, of course, talking about key ranges here in the fixed income market. I want you to bring that over to the equity market. Ira Jersey says 4.18% on a 10 year yield is a big deal. Right now, the 10-year yield is 4.20%. How do equities react if yields go price up, yield down, outside the recent range? Price up, yield down, I think would be really supportive for big parts of the market. You may actually see a little bit of action in the small and mid caps, which have been, as we know, huge laggers. Up 1.8% right now. Yeah. And here's what I'll say. Fundamentally, that segment of the market is not as strong as what we see in the large cap indices and the mega right. cap companies. That said, this is the news that we need for smaller right. segments of the of the uh, business community, that rates are on the path down because we right. know that has been a headwind for operations. I got one more question, Kate Moore, and then we got to go over to Ira Jersey to tell us what to do. You are you, you don't remember the analogs that we remember, the nifty 60, I was, you know, nifty 50 rather in the 60s and all that, even 99, 2000. Does Kate Moore have an equity market analog you're working off of or is this a whole new world after all? Yeah, Tom, I do remember 99, 2000. Uh, don't worry, I'm not that young. But <laughs> what I will say is uh, I don't see a perfect analog right here. And I know everyone wants to pick a period in history and say it looks just like this. And it, it's a comfort, you know, people like that comfort. But, but we are in a, the midst of, I think, a massive technological change here with the advent of, of AI and as companies try and figure out how to adopt AI and figure out the use cases and what the best uh, way to work with this technology is. And I think that's gonna lead to this incredible, you know, uh, bifurcation in the market. Companies that have access mm -hmm. to the technology have access to amazing data sets and are using it appropriately, and those that don't. You're starting to see that separation in earnings already. And I just don't know that we, or at least in the, the lifetime I've been in, almost five decades, that um, we've seen this significant of a technological change. Kate Moore, thank you so much. BlackRock, she's got to talk to her uh, esteemed colleagues at BlackRock right now. Greatly, greatly appreciate that. Um, I, I got to be honest, folks. We really don't care what Ira Jersey thinks about rates here with futures up six. It's a nice lift to the market after the excitement of 831. Ira Jersey joins us now with Bloomberg Intelligence, and he is a surveillance soccer expert. <laughs> England or Spain? Wow. Discuss. Uh, I'm going to go with Spain. They've just looked really good, and they are very or in a very organized team. Um, and England, un until yesterday, had a big problem scoring. So, um, I mean, I think it'll be a fun game. It's it's you know certainly two very good teams, so it'll be fun to watch. I was briefed by Mr. Farrow earlier this morning. He made clear it was a VAR gift to the English. Did England <laughs> steal that from the Netherlands? Uh, I don't know. They were, I think, on the day either of those two teams could have won. Um, yeah, you know, I it's not a big surprise. I, I'm right. not sure. 
um, about that particular call. But at the same time, it's, uh, you know, England got a deserved win. So and oh, yeah, so I'm a Villa supporter, so Ollie yeah. Watkins scoring is helpful. So. There's your obligatory soccer talk for the day in the middle of huge inflation data. Paul, why don't you get us on the straight and narrow? Exactly. All right, Ira, we had this inflation print came in a little bit softer than expected. Uh, what's your market? What's the Treasury market telling you about what we saw in the inflation print? Yeah, the, so the, the Treasury market liked it, and uh, the, the Treasury market has rallied. We've seen some what we call bull steepening. So you have the front end yields. So yields on the two year note are uh, are lower more than yields on the long end of the yield curve. Uh, so that's uh, what we call bull steepening of the curve, and, and that's not a huge surprise because you know what what this data does. It gives more confidence to the market that not only might the Fed cut in September, uh, but once they do start to cut, assuming that we continue to have reasonably decent inflation prints and, and a slowing economy, that the Fed will probably go more regularly. And that's one of the reasons why you see um, the shorter end of the yield curve, the two-year note and five-year note, uh, do a little bit better than than the long end, uh, because that tends to be far more sensitive to interest rate cuts by the Fed. So it's it's not a huge surprise. And at Tom, as you noted, uh, you know, four point one eight percent on the ten year is actually a pretty important technical level because below that we're going to test four percent again. And I think you know four percent is more of a psychological level than anything you know well, economically important. But uh, but nonetheless, you can wind up seeing a pretty big move. We printed under. 4.18, but to pros like you, Ira, <laughs> you need to close under 4.18, am I right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so we, we do need to uh, to see a convince. I call it a convincing break. So what what often happens is you you can make all these lines on charts, and ultimately what uh, what what usually you use those for are things like putting stop losses or uh, or stop reverses in. So you you if you're if you're short the market, for example, uh, you you hope that interest rates will go <laughs> up, right? So yields will go up, um, and if you know, so if you say okay, four point one eight percent's a um, uh, is a key technical level, you'll put a stop in at 417 or 416. Um, so you need a more convincing break than just like half a basis point. Ira, I'm looking at the WERP function, world interest rate probability. If I'm reading this correctly, market's looking like maybe like an 85% chance of a rate cut in September. Oh, listen to you. You're doing exactly. WIRP. Cool. <laughs> I am. I am. <laughs> Can I pencil that in, Ira? Can I put it in with ink? What do we do here? Well, the, the market certainly is coming around to that that thought. Um, you know, I've been very skeptical that the Fed would have enough good data to go in September, but uh, you know, today's data was certainly good. We, we remember we still have a bunch of prints before then, so we okay. still have two more inflation data. Plus, we have all the the PC numbers as well as the the spending and payrolls, right? So we have all of the important data that we're going to get uh, over the next couple right. of months. And uh, you know, if that turns around and this happens to be the weakest inflation print over the the right. over that three month period. Period, then maybe September's off the table, but the market certainly is pricing for a September cut. I think what's 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 important though is that we were also priced in now for another cut in, after that in September, uh, in November, excuse me. So, um, so, so yes. basically, the market is right. starting to price for a string of cuts as right. opposed to just one and then a pause right. for a little while. I, I got one minute. That's all. I'm so sorry. How does our world change if we get a close of 3.99%? on the 10 year <laughs> yield. I don't think anybody's ready for that. Yeah, it, it well, it doesn't change a ton a ton but what it, it what the 10 year going down that low you would see lower mortgage rates right so you would see certainly uh but I, I think some corporates start to come in and maybe pre-refinance some higher coupon debt that they issued say two or three years ago so um so you can end up having a situation where uh ironically lower rates leads to uh easier financial conditions and that actually might work against what the fed wants to do or, or do the feds work for them um so certainly certainly though you're only going to get there if the market is more convinced that the Fed's going to cut pretty aggressively. Ira Jersey, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. What's, what a great art. I mean, to have Sam and Crosley, wow. one Kate after the Moore, other, and then Ira Jersey. Yeah. It's amazing. You get the add on of the interns. I know. And everything just gets easier. Absolutely. A ton of moves in the currency markets. The yen rallying here. Now, 158 yeah. spot, 9 2. We were yeah. at 161 just a a yep, day or so ago, so, so big move yeah, there. Thank up. you, Ari, for that. So that it's it's you know it's great. I mean, I'm listening to the people in the bond market, and they're going, "We got to hold on to what we've got." Yeah, it doesn't make a difference if you make it or not. It's Sambora's birthday. Oh, baby. he's 49. <laughs>
This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. We're addicted to the parlor game, the yep. Fed, the monetary ballet. Where do you see opportunities in a fixed income space here in 24? With Lisa Mateo on markets. AI affecting demand for cloud computing. And Michael Barr with news. Another legal setback for Donald Trump, this time across the pond. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. Tom Keen, Paul Sweeney, Michael Barr, Jen Tucker in for Lisa Mateo. Market moving CPI report with a negative statistic on one of the series, a month over month series. So it, it's, it's a big shock to see that negative uh, number. Uh, equities exploded higher, yields come in, and they've reversed here in the last 30 minutes as people digest uh, the day. day. Paul, Paul, maybe a little bit of a angst as well. Early this morning, Delta and Pepsi yep. saying there are new challenges out there. Yeah, exactly right. So we had some uh, weaker than expected results from a couple of names. Of course, on the earnings front, it's all about the banks uh, starting tomorrow, Tom. <coughs> Yields here, just they're still lower here. The 10-year Treasury is off about nine basis points, 4.19%, right. Tom. We're going to keep this quick here. Michael Darda will be with us uh, in moments. From the Interactive Broker Studios with Futures Red, negative five, John Tucker. All right, Fed Chair Jerome Powell yesterday saying he needed more confidence that inflation was slowing before moving to cut rates. He's got more evidence now. CPI prints showing inflation slowing more than expected last month. Uh, prices fell from a month earlier. And you heard uh, Fed Governor, former <coughs> Fed Governor Randy Krosner telling Bloomberg surveillance a little earlier. This does set the stage for a move in September. Uh, Treasury yields have fallen two year, 11 basis points lower, 451, 10 year right now, nine basis points lower. And that is at uh, just below 420 at this point. Stock futures initially popping higher. They have uh, since moved to being relatively unchanged, as Paul mentioned. Uh, some of the individual shares on the move this morning, among the most active in the pre-market shares of Pfizer, they are up close to 3%. Moving forward with a weight loss pill, they're trying to crack the multi-billion dollar market for obesity medications. Uh, other companies opening their books. Delta Airlines expecting profit this quarter to fall short of estimates. They're blaming heavy competition that's driving ticket prices down. And PepsiCo reporting weaker than expected sales growth. And we check the markets for you all day long. Right here on Bloomberg Radio, I'm John Tucker, and that is your Bloomberg Business Flash, Paul and Tom. Well, John Tucker, thanks so much. On Sunday, he writes a note blending in economics and his uh, finance and investment. Michael Darda at Roth joins us now. There's a single sentence, Michael Darda. The history of central banking is the history of fighting the last war. Which war is Jerome Powell fighting right now with this new report of disinflation? Thanks for having me on, Tom. Obviously, you know they're in, they're fighting the inflationary war here still, uh, a, uh, a war of their own making. So, <clears throat> coming into this business cycle expansion, the Fed did a historic open-ended stimulus combined with, you know, world war levels of fiscal expansion. And then we had a two-year inflation overshoot with a booming V-shaped nominal GDP growth recovery that we didn't see in the last yep. cycle. Okay, so why did that happen? Well, you know, there was a perception that even with all that stimulus, we wouldn't be able to get the economy going and that, and that inflation wouldn't get back up to target. So we certainly learned that lesson. Uh, and so now I think, you know, you mentioned Powell yesterday saying they want more confidence that inflation really is returning to target. And I think they're going to get that confidence. You know, this is the, the second month in a row actually where super core services inflation has been negative month over month. Uh, and we had a few, you know, hot readings before that. Right. So July's probably too soon, but I do think it, it looks right. increasing like the first rate cut is going to be right. in the bag for September. Paul insists I do a, a nerd question here. <laughs> it keeps the plot going here at 9 a.m. Good morning on YouTube across America. Michael Darter with us after this stunning disinflation report. Uh, I think we're on the same page, Michael Darda. I see nominal GDP coming in. I saw it in organic revenue growth at Pepsi uh, today. Uh, is the Fed establishing now an understanding of the new nominal GDP regime forward? Well, I hope so, Tom. I mean, nominal growth for this cycle has averaged double digits, and that's why we've been in a high inflation cycle. 
Why was inflation low during the last cycle? Nominal growth averaged just about 4% per annum. So with productive capacity growing around 2% per annum, you know, you know, that's about, you know, 4% nominal growth would be about what you'd want for price stability for the Fed to hit its inflation target. I think nominal growth is run, you know, ran about 3%, 3.5% in Q2. So for the first half of uh, of this year as an average sub 4%. The Fed's policy rate is 5.3. We have the unemployment rate up seven tenths from the cyclical trough seen last year in January and April, something that you don't see historically unless the economy right. is on the edge of a recession. So I think the Fed is on a tightrope here, wanting increasing confidence that inflation is rolling over. Uh, but with nominal growth slowing uh, and inflation expectations coming in right there at the low end of what right. would be considered consistent with price stability. I do think the risk here is that the Fed right. actually falls a bit behind the curve, presides over a passive tightening of monetary conditions, and that's how the business right. cycle could flip away from us. Paul Serena, using the Bloomberg terminal, Kathy Jones agrees with Michael Dart as she features the breakdown of super core CPI. Oh, okay, very good. Michael, are we in fact experiencing right now a soft landing? Uh, no doubt about it, Paul. We have been in a soft landing in the sense that the economy is slowing, at least nominal growth has been slowing consistently and persistently, but not in a way that has catalyzed a, a recessionary condition yet. Uh, but frankly, we could be much closer to that than many believe. I mentioned the unemployment rate moving seven tenths off of the cyclical trough. And so a late cycle environment, early innings of recession can look a lot like a soft landing and it's a soft landing until it's not. And in order to preserve the soft landing, it really requires the Fed to have a foresight and a timing that it hasn't demonstrated in the past. So, you know, I'm obviously a bit skeptical, but we have this incredible AI frenzy going on that's driven the S&P up to dizzying heights. So there's a lot of optimism in certain pockets of the equity market uh, that are you know, related to these new technologies where there are incredibly, incredibly high hopes. Uh, so looking at all of that, I think it you know, probably does play into a bit of hesitation on the part of the Fed. They likely will move in September, uh, but even so could end up uh, a bit behind the curve here. And I do think that means ongoing elevated business cycle. I the math here, Paul, but NVIDIA just broke out to a 136 level. Yeah, I mean, it go. just doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. And that kind of go, goes to the point, Michael. Uh, we talk a lot about this economic data, whether it's inflation or jobs or GDP, but boy, uh, uh, the vast majority of Americans feel pinched here. And there's not much the Fed can do about that, right? Prices are where they are. They generally don't go down. Um, it's just a question of the rate of inflation. And I guess the Fed can't do much for most of these Americans out there. Yeah, that is true, Paul. I mean, you know, the Fed isn't going to be able to preside over a, a deflationary period to correct the, the rise in the price level uh, that would, you know, end up precipitating a, likely a huge crash in the labor market, which, you know, I don't think anybody wants to see. Uh, so the best thing the Fed can do here is restore price stability. And then I would say try to be a bit more forward looking so we stay out of these boom to bust cycles. Uh, and, and with that, that's really the best thing that they could do to lay the foundation for sustainable, tight labor markets. But the key word is sustainable. Right. If you have price stability, you're not in a sustainable situation for the labor market. Uh, so, so that's where I think we need to go. That's what the Fed could do, you know, could do to help. Right. Uh, but trying to catalyze a big deflation to reverse the previous inflation, not probably possible without a, a huge loss function for the labor market. Michael uh, Darter, thank you so much with Roth Partners uh, here this morning. Paul, you nailed it. You're way, you're way out in front of the zeitgeist. Sweeney notices an almost two standard deviation strength in Japanese yen. We need to clarify this. I see no headlines talking about intervention. There will no. be people out there saying, under the cover of U.S. inflation, this, that, or the other thing happened in Japan. I see no indication of that now. Japanese yen rallies 2% against dollar. 
Uh, another headline, yen surges as traders bail on crowded yeah. short bets. That's what that feels I like. I like that. Yeah, that's kind that's of what I think of, we're seeing in there, some of this. Because we got all the way out to 162, right. almost one, I mean, 161, almost 162, and here we are, got a big move on but the But I see print. no intervention, gossip, yep, or speculation. Yep. That's important. Also important, our news in New York City, Michael Buck. Thank you very much, Tom, Paul, John. President Joe Biden faces mounting opposition within his own party. Axios reported that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is open to replacing Biden as the Democrats' nominee. Bloomberg government reporter Jack Fitzpatrick spoke to Bloomberg Daybreak. Senator Schumer outwardly is saying he's still with Biden. Uh, my colleague Eric Wasson caught him just after that Axios report and the uh, majority leader of the Senate said said he's he's with Joe, uh, but the private possibility of signaling openness to another nominee is a significant development. As members it, at times call for the president to drop out, but others s sort of stay in a gray area, saying they support the president, but somehow signal openness to another nominee. Bloomberg government reported Jack Fitzpatrick on Bloomberg Daybreak. Meanwhile, today, President Biden will close out the NATO summit in Washington with a solo press conference. Last night, during his dinner toast, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg touted the alliance. We are not a normal family with uh, totally normal friends and partners because we are a military alliance with close partners that we work together with every day. So therefore, a toast for the most successful, the strongest, and the longest lasting alliance in history. Secretary General Stoltenberg and NATO members celebrated 75 years of the defense alliance. Boeing Starliner says they are confident the spacecraft can get two astronauts home safely. The two former Navy members have been aboard the International Space Station for more than a month after Starliner experienced mechanical issues, including helium leaks and thruster issues that delayed their flight back. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom Paul John. we got to get out front of this. I mean, Michael Nathanson's coming up. And, you know, I mean, a hitter like him. Player. He's got, you know, Rivera of the Yankees in the backdrop behind him. I mean, I like that. the Yankees have cratered. I mean, it's embarrassing. And they're out seriously. They're looking for four relief pitchers. I don't know what's going in on. In the deadline. I mean, they got to, they, they, they're the Yankees. They got to, they got to right the ship. Well, thank goodness they won last night. But yeah, I mean, this has been, you know, look out people on Fifth Avenue because the wagon wheels fell off, man, <laughs> and are rolling. I, I haven't, I, I bought all in in the first couple of months of the Yankees because they were right. playing like I did too. 1998 baseball. Yeah, <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. By the Same way, the number. Mets, they're over 500 now. Right. So uh, this is I, I interesting. Mean, you know, Nathanson's in entertainment. He could dovetail this. I mean, he could be like George Costanza. He could work for the Yankees. <laughs> he could do that. Solve the relief problem. You can't bring Rivera Cotton uniforms. Back, but, bring him back. You know. So. There's all kinds of stuff going on there. I'm like you. I was hook, line, and sick. I'm a Red Sox fan, and I was talking about the dreaded Yankees like it was 1927. Yeah, I Sox bought in. in back, Red Sox are back in the discussion, Tom. Yeah. Uh, you're going to have some baseball this summer to pay attention to. There's a lot of baseball. It's, yep. it's with a new playoff format. Like, there's 30 teams, Michael Barr. Bloomberg Business Sports, 32 of the 30 teams are <laughs> eligible to go to the World Series, and, right? And real quickly, the, the worst team in baseball, the Chicago White Sox, pitcher yesterday, pitched the immaculate inning. Nine pitches, three no strikes kidding. each. Wow. wow. Very good. Nice story. CPI report, Musa Marcus. We do showbiz with Michael Nathanson in a moment. It's Bloomberg's Surveillance.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker, the Bloomberg Newsroom, with this Bloomberg Business Flash. Really good report. Uh, to borrow Fed Chair Jerome Powell's words, consumer price index cooling broadly for the month of June. Driven by this long-awaited slowdown in housing costs, uh, Fed swaps now pricing in more easing for 2024. We get two more inflation and jobs reports before the September FOMC meeting. Uh, some of the individual shares on the move. Delta Airlines warning that domestic carriers struggling to fill planes in the all-important summer travel season dragging down ticket prices in a fair war that's weighing on profits. They're offering that grim assessment this morning, reporting worse than expected financial results. Uh, right now, we have uh, futures higher, stock futures, Dow futures up 20 points, S&P E-mini futures a uh, point higher right now. And as we look at years, the two-year 12 basis points lower, 449. Oh, listen, John Tucker quoting basis points. The 10-year. it doesn't do Close to 10 basis points lower. That's Very at 4.18%. It's moving. Yeah. And we check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Yeah. Paul Tom. Uh, thank you. We've anticipated this so much. Michael Nathanson works with a guy named Craig Moffat. And to be blunt, they, they'll they do like a 20-page report, 40-page yeah, just... report. There's no one in Hollywood who does not read it, yep. is how I would put it. Everybody reads it cover to cover. It's gospel. Michael Nathanson joins us right now. Michael, I want to get one question in here before yes, Paul no. goes to the madness that's going out in Hollywood. <laughs> NBC is bringing in $1.2 billion large on the Olympics. The boats down the River Center sold out. The closing ceremonies sold out. All that. Gusto and Dressage is sold out. Everything's <laughs> sold out. But are we going to watch the Olympics? I don't know, Tom. I don't think so. I, I think the Olympic moment has passed us by. I really do. I think oh. last time we talked about this, the previous Olympics, part of the problem is you don't know where to find it. You know, it's on Peacock, and they've spread it all out. And, you know, sometimes the games are in real time. So, you know, you're not in front of the set or in front of your computer when things are happening. I, I don't know. I, I I think, especially in European time zones, it's not ideal. So I, I'd say to you, I'm more bearish on the Olympics and other sports at this point in time. <laughs> All right. So, Michael, I guess one of the data points that really sets the bar of where the media business is today is paramount. Um, Sherry Redstone finally agreed to sell the company, arguably maybe five years too late. But what do you make of how this whole thing un just un unfurled? It seems like I always joke on air that Five years ago, people like me or you could have sold this company with three phone calls. What happened here? Yeah, it, Paul, it, it's mind boggling and kind of sad how this yes, all went down, sad is right? It, it, it's sad. Thank you. Um, sad is yeah. dead on. And, and Tom, you know what? It's sad because it's, there's so many jobs that are being lost because of bad management and bad decision making. And Paul's right, five years ago, this would have been easier. What's weird to me is that she walked away from a similar deal less than a month ago. She has three people in place with new business plans, selling assets, and then comes back to the table, right? And it's like, you don't have a CEO there. You have three co-CEOs. <laughs> it's, it's been managed to death, right? And we would have argued three years ago when they went into streaming that they didn't understand their balance sheet. They couldn't afford a streaming war because all their exposure to profits are tied to cable networks, right? So the decision to do what they did was idiotic, and they could have stopped along the way and rethought the strategy. But she went to a place where she had few options. I would have preferred, if I was a shareholder, to see where the new three CEO strategy played out before she went back to the table. It's, it's you know, just look at the amount of wealth lost in a Redstone family versus the Murdochs, right? Or the Roberts family, right? Like they were all in similar places 20 years ago when Paul covered the sector, and their fortunes have diverged massively because of bad decision making. It's it's that simple. It really is. So I guess, Michael, the I guess the attention now probably moves to Warner Brothers Discovery. Thank goodness David Zaslov's out in Sun Valley holding court as he likes to do. What happens to that company? Yeah, the big issue they have right now is they're gonna appears they're gonna lose the NBA. And the NBA is the most important asset they have in their cable network business, right? 
if they lose the NBA and there's some question about will they go after the NBA and say, look, we have a right to ne- renegotiate, that it's not clear if they've lost it or not. So this is going to be fun to watch. But he he will need to replace the NBA with something else. Um, I don't know what that something else is because there's really nothing available of the NBA scale to, to license right. now. I think, you know, again, having all that leverage tied to cable networks is a very, very tough hand. Right. I, he has very few options here. Either, you know, there's not a lot of M&A left to do. There's not a lot of sports right. rights to buy. He's the man, he's has to manage the business down, basically, right. you know? I, you know, Mike, I got, I got like eight ways to go here. I want to ask about CBS. <laughs> okay. I don't know the time. I want to ask about this. I want to ask what Mario Gabelli's going to do, et cetera. Gordon Crawford, if he's still working in Capital Group, forget about it all. <laughs> What's your single best buy in your beleaguered world? The Yankees are terrible. Entertainment rough, rough is terrible. Rough. What is yes. Michael Nathanson going along with enthusiasm right now? Yeah, it's funny because all this whole year we always said, hey, we have a couple of short ideas for you. <laughs> and most of your investors are not shorting stocks. Uh, you know, our view, and Robert Fisher and I cover media, you know, Disney south of 100 feels like that's a good opportunity. It is because, you know, in the streaming wars, they're number two to Netflix. Netflix is one. We know that. Netflix is valued at a very, 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 very high multiple, and Disney's entire enterprise value is below that of Netflix. So I look at Disney and think to myself, you know, their streaming business, which at once was very highly valued, is kind of forgotten about. And Parks is a, a really stable business. I know we're heading into, well, I don't know if we're heading into a slowdown. It feels like the market thinks we are, but the park business is pretty stable. It's Disney, and their, their content cycle finally starting to go the right way. Right. And they have Deadpool 3 coming. So, I don't know, Tom, you know, it's a 25%, 30% upside on Diz. But the issue is going to be, look, they're still, right. you know, still, you know, dealing with linear network decline. That's just hard to yeah. ignore. Paul, right? get so, one more in here. One more in here. Yeah. On, on Disney, Michael, this, I'd love to get your thoughts on uh, Bob Iger and succession plans here. Is there a viable plan there, do you think? And is it one that the street will embrace <laughs> once we can kind of learn about it? Well, it's a viable plan there because it's the single most important objective the board has to solve for, right? So it was done incorrectly or badly the last time. The board knows this is their priority. There is an activist in there challenging them on how they did it the last time. They won't mess yeah. it up. I mean, they will go through a, a good process. In terms of who it's going to be, there are right. three or four names internally. <clears throat> we are at this point watching on the outside. Right. Like, I don't think it's going to be messed up. And the choice is going to be vetted and tested, and right. and it won't be challenged as a bad process. 20 seconds. What do your beloved yes. Nate Yankees do? What's the Nathanson formula <laughs> to take okay. the Giants of May back to something respectable in September? Well, well, Tom, over the past decade or so, I would have said you need to change the general manager, and you need to change well, and Aaron Boone. Like, I think they've constructed a bad team time and time again. And it goes with the construction. And I've been saying this forever. Um, Brian Cashman won when the game was different in terms of the money they're able to spend. And I think they have to start again and basically rebuild it to the team they had, the type of right. team they had 20 years ago. Contact hitters, get on base guys. The swing for the fence mentality just doesn't work. And their pitching staff continually is, disappoints. Paul, we're in the wrong business. He's talking yeah. Yankees in the YouTube live chat lights up like a candle. I know, exactly. Michael I know. Nathanson. But, but, but yeah. Tom, we missed the Ranger postmortem because that would have been fun. I mean, that. that would, uh, yeah. let, let me come back next year and do a Rangers podcast. Come back, come back next week. Bring Moffat exactly. with you. Michael Nathanson, thank you so much. Moffat Nathanson, definitive uh, in entertainment. Uh, can't say enough about that. Without question. The YouTube live chat of the day, trophy taker, Randy, his allocation, 50% SPX, 50% lotto tickets. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Just by Thank Nvidia you for that. Can we good. get him tomorrow on the yeah. 7C block, Randy, from wherever? That's great. 50% SPX, 50% lotto tickets. John Tucker, that's sort of your strategy, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, 50, 50. Roll the dice. Line up the the Wawa. Here, you you buying there. the tickets at the Wawa? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see. Green on the screen. We went up big. We came down red on the screen. We come back. Futures flat. Bloomberg surveillance. Good morning.
Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Hey, and I'm John Tucker, the Bloomberg Newsroom, with his Bloomberg Business Flash, uh, waiting for the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange. Ahead of that, Treasury is falling. Fed swaps projecting more easing this year, almost fully pricing in a September reduction. The uh, core consumer price index climbing a tenth of a percent. That's the smallest advance since August of 2021. And earnings season also underway, right out of the gate, S&P 500 adding to its record close yesterday. Right now, two points higher. We're at 56.35. The Nasdaq Composite Index, 10 points higher at 18,688. The Dow Jones Industrial Average right now up 25 points, 39,750 on the index. And we check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker, and that's the opening bell report. Paul, Tom. Hey, Paul, did you agree with me? Tucker does a bull market data check oh, yeah. better than a bear market data <laughs> check. Fair weather friend. Have, we, That's have what you is. done the opening of the 401k? Are you are you still a 201k? No, it's covered? it's. I would say it's a 501k now. Really? Yeah, exactly. We've been doing killed quite it? well since the start of the year. So, you oh, know. okay. Just killing it. So your actuarial point of retirement is what 2034. <laughs> so I, I give myself another 10, 15. <laughs> if if they'll. That's the important caveat. If they'll have me. If they'll have you, I believe they will. Sparta adores your work. Thank you so much, John Tucker. <laughs> Do we have Lisa back tomorrow? Is it another day? Uh, it'll be no, no, Monday. No. Suffered Monday. through me. And you're not Friday. here tomorrow. No, God forbid. It's so a Friday, it's, it's me and the John Tucker show. Oh. We can pull this off. Do, do I have a guest? We can, can we, pull this can off. Can we sell a guest for tomorrow? Is there, do I have a co-anchor tomorrow? Or am I? We're effort, we're efforting to co co-anchor. <laughs> you're already getting rid of me. That's okay. Gur, Gur is fly fishing somewhere. Yeah. Something like that. We say good morning to all of you. Um, they hand me, I, I get it late at night, like with the daylight savings time, sometimes the sun set. And the butler comes in with a silver platter and gives me the guest list yep. for the next sure. day. And the only name I saw when they gave me the list last night at 8.30 was Charles Lieberman. Chuck Lieberman has a few miles under the belt, under the road. Chemical He's bank. CIO. That? Yeah, chemical that bank. Exactly. Big. That's... 90% of the audience doesn't even know how important Chemical Bank and Chuck Lieberman were years ago with advisors, capital management. Someone with experience joins us. Chuck Lieberman, most of our listeners and viewers have never experienced this character of a bull market. What character is this bull market? Well, believe it or not, I think it's based on fundamentals. Uh, Thanks, Tom, for that warm introduction. Uh, we go back a long ways. Uh, and you and I remember that over time, the economy grows. Uh, the markets are, are volatile. They go up and down. But nonetheless, uh, ultimately, the market is tied to the economy. And the economy has done very well. Um, GDP is at record high levels. Uh, household income is at record high levels. Household finances are in great shape. Uh, there's no reason for the market to be anything other than at record levels. So how do we think about equities versus fixed income, Chuck? Where are the, the best value, the best opportunities here? What's your asset allocation? Well, I think the uh, S&P 493 is very attractive. <laughs> <clears throat> you can find lots of great values there. The market's fixated, of course, on the Magnificent Seven. Um, and in many cases, I think they deserve their high valuations. They are growing rapidly, so they should have a high value uh, and a high valuation. Um, maybe in some cases, uh, they're a little bit extended, um, but it's easy actually finding very good values among the 493. And when people look at the S&P multiple and they compare it historically, they're comparing apples and oranges. Uh, today, uh, the four, the 500 is dominated by the seven. And so it distorts the PE multiple uprising right. and it gives the impression that the whole market's expensive. And that's just not the case. Chuck Lieberman, I had a big lecture this morning on this. Uh, I was saying to uh, one of our younger youth that the PE is overrated and you need to look at other denominators with price, like price to cash flow, et cetera. Do you rely on price to earnings? It's one of the metrics we look at, 
But I agree with you. I, I think price to cash flow is far more important. Uh, and that's far more of what we look at. We also look at balance sheets. We look at competitive positions of companies. We're doing this in, from the bottom up. Uh, the overall numbers, when you look at the uh, P multiples for the S&P right. 500 or even the 493, you know, right. it's a mix of everything under the sun. Uh, and that's not the way to pick investments. Uh, when you look right. at specific companies, you can find great companies at reasonable multiples with good uh, dividends right. in many cases and good prospects. Paul, Apple, yes. free cash flow. Oh boy. The pandemic bottom. They're selling a lot of iPhones. Yep. Uh, 73 gazillion. Yep. Now they're modeling an out a year out from now, 117. Yep. 73 to 117 <laughs> growth of free cash flow. Buying back a lot of stock. Uh, Chuck, we're going to hear from uh, some of our big bank friends tomorrow, including Jamie Dimon. How do you think about the money center banks here these <clears throat> days as an opportunity? I, I like them all. Uh, so nice. the banking sector got crushed uh, uh, a year and a half ago because of uh, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, uh, and it revealed some other problems across the banking sector. Uh, they're all being repaired or have already been repaired. Balance sheets are actually in very good shape, plenty of excess capital. Uh, the Fed is slowly but surely ramping up capital requirements for banks, uh, and yet they're meeting those hurdles, and they're buying back stock. Uh, They've been a bit vol uh, volatile, but recently they've done fairly well. And I think they're still quite cheap pretty much across the board. I like all the money centers. Uh, when you get to the regionals, there are more issues because they have more exposure to commercial real estate. And we know that there are problems in that sector. Right. Uh, but companies are all pushing out loans. They're getting the borrowers to put up a little more capital. Uh, they're extending the loans. Right. Uh, they're buying time and time will, will fix these problems. So I'm really comfortable yeah. with most of the larger uh, regionals. I think they have very, very good value. They're still very cheap. They've mm -hmm. also come back a bit in recent weeks, uh, but they're still quite cheap from a long-term perspective. For all of you worldwide and across the nation, this is a joy and I must say an honor as well with the heritage, the resume of Paul Sweeney and Chuck Lieberman. I don't think 99.9% .9 of people, Paul, know this, that J.P. Morgan Chase came from Chemical Bank. And Chemical Bank yep. did a roll up with Chuck Lieberman <laughs> of Chase Manhattan Bank, Manny Hanny, yep. where I was as a child. I could only shave one day a week. <laughs> Texas yeah. Commerce oh, yeah. and the Corn Exchange Bank and they were rolled into Chemical Bank, and then basically they did a redo name and called it, you know, Chase Manhattan. What was that like, Chuck Lieberman, when Chemical Bank did the mother of all roll-ups? It was astonishing. I never thought that the uh, government would approve all those deals. Uh, I was blown away that they did, but it created a, a real powerhouse. And I remember one of the questions I was asked, take two mediocre banks, Chemical and Manny combine them and what do you get? You get a big uh, mediocre <laughs> bank. And I explained, no, that's not right. Uh, they actually cherry picked the best from both sides and they ended up with an absolute powerhouse. And that's the way it's playing out. Uh, it's been a great holding. Um, it, it's a great tradition that I was a part of. Um, for the last 25 years, I've been managing money and, and uh, you know, this is one of the things that I look at the kind of strength of some of these institutions. And and they get uh, plenty of bad headlines. Uh, a city just had to pay uh, a significant amount of money over a hundred million dollars uh, as a fine. Uh, but these companies are cheap and they're critical to the economy and they will continue to do very well. When rates uh, yeah. come down a little bit, uh, you're gonna see them mint money. Uh, they're doing very right. well now and they're gonna mint even more. So these are all yeah. really, really attractive investments. Quickly, Paul, your observation on the chemical bank roll-up that became Fortress Diamond. It was great. I mean, uh, you know, Chase Manhattan Bank and merged with the, the chemical, which is, as Chuck mentioned, also included Manny Hanny. So at that point in time, yeah. very early 90s, dominant uh, bank. Did and you we, take two hour lunches at 270 Park Avenue? No, but if you got up and left your desk, you had to have your sport coat on, your jacket on. Yeah, I, mean, I remember that, yes. Yeah, if, I, I once got caught in the elevator without my jacket on, the last time I did that, as, this a, is as true. a very young banker. Can you believe that? Now, now everybody's wearing a Patagonian vest, they look like yep. morons. Yep.
Yep. So they look sort of like Sassauer. They look like Sassauer. Right, exactly. I mean, and now Paul is the fashion police here at yeah. Bloomberg. Yeah. Yeah. So Thank you, no, Paul. Exactly. Chuck Lieberman, honored to have you on today to talk about Chemical Bank and where we're going in this great uh, bull market. We'll get him back on here. You know, when we, we're, uh, we're going to hit this SPX 6,000. Red on the screen right now, actually. A little bit flightier. SPX flat for the morning. Dow, negative 78 points. With our news in New York City, he had an account at Chemical Bank, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom. Paul, John, President Joe Biden faces a key day of his presidency as he prepares for a high-stakes solo press conference later today to wrap up the NATO summit in Washington. Biden and top allies are seeking to stem the flow of congressional Democrats calling for him to step aside as the party's nominee. Top Biden aides are heading to Capitol Hill to meet with Senate Democrats today in an attempt to prevent further calls for the president to bow out of the race. The House is considering a contempt resolution for Attorney General Merrick Garland brought by Republican Congresswoman Anna Paulina Luna, Florida. This specific resolution forces the House to vote on the measure. Luna says if passed, the resolution would fine Garland $10,000 per day until he complies with handing over audio tapes that special counsel Robert Hur recorded of his interview with President Biden during the classified documents investigation. With Attorney General Garland and the Department of Justice refusing to follow the law, we have been left with no choice but to rely on inherent contempt, our constitutional authority to hold an individual accountable for refusing to comply with congressional demands. Meanwhile, Democratic Congressman Jim McGovern did not hold back when addressing the floor about the resolution. This is a stupid resolution. Republican leadership knows this is a stupid resolution. Their own members know this is a stupid resolution but they're beholden to the craziest MAGA members in their conference. Congressman McGovern says Republicans want to get the recordings because they think the RNC can use them in attack ads. Jurors in New Mexico will continue to hear testimony today in the involuntary manslaughter trial of actor Alec Baldwin. The trial coming more than two years after the fatal shooting on the set of Rust. In opening statements yesterday, prosecutors disputed Baldwin's claim that he did not pull the trigger on the gun that killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins in October of 2021. Defense lawyers say the shooting was a tragic accident. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it. With Bloomberg News Now, I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, John. Thanks so much. I got to hit the blue button. The Detroit yep. Lions blue exactly. button. Do they, they, I, this came up the other day. I'm, I'm pulling this out of, out of the hat. Okay, spring training. It's all fun and games in Florida and Arizona. Yeah. But when the NFL gets ready for a fourth week of August game, are they out in this heat? Well, yeah, <laughs> they're going to be playing in this. And, and, and keep in mind now, we have narrowed the number of exhibition games. So, yeah, and now each exhibition game is more telling than what it used to be in the past. But we have, I mean, most of these stadiums are domed now, aren't they? I mean, they got to yeah. almost move to a dome just For to get the it, weather. I would think it's weather. dangerous. Well, yeah, but, you, but if you're playing in Chicago, uh, you're not in the dome. No. No. And, you know, it's, it's not like playing at Ford Field where you're in the yeah, dome. Exactly. You know, it's, it, there are a lot of places out there. In Florida, yeah. I mean, there, yeah. there are a lot Brutal. of... Brutal. Yeah, it's going to be tough. You know, people fighting for their lives to make a, t a team and the heat index is 95 or 100. Back yeah. in the day, running two-a-days and outside and no water that. breaks. and Yeah, yeah. no I mean, water breaks. I remember back that. In the day. It's yeah. cruel. Yeah. Now, it's now like, they don't hit you know, and they, they don't drink. Yeah. <laughs> Takes to the third or fourth game before they get yeah. ready. <laughs> yeah. Football the, coming up. Do the Jets even have fall training? Or they just <laughs> start with the first game. Uh, we've got a quarterback coming we back. We will see. We've got to get a Mohamed El Arian in here to give us a Jets update. That's what we need. Red and green on the screen now. Well, it's a sprightly market, but red and green on the screen. From New York City, this is Bloomberg Surveillance.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash. The Acora Consumer Price Index climbing a tenth of a percent. It's actually the smallest advance that we've seen since August of 2021. The year-over-year -year measure, 3.3% a rise there. Also the slowest in more than three years. That's the inflation data this morning. Earnings season also underway. And with signs of disinflation, uh, Treasury yields, they are plunging two-year yield. Just about 11 basis points lower, 451. The 10-year is down about 10 basis points. That is at 418. Now, stock investors still trying to digest it, uh, mulling it over, a little movement in the risk assets. And uh, Delta Airlines, among the individual shares on the move, sliding the uh, carrier's third quarter adjusted earnings per share forecast of missing estimates. Consumers cutting back on snacks, apparently PepsiCo, reporting weaker than expected revenue growth. The snack food business was hurt by increasingly budget-focused shoppers. I'm surprised they didn't blame Wigovi. Um, S&P 500 right now up two points, three points we'll call it 56.37. That's a record. The uh, Nasdaq Composite Index of five points at 18,653. That's a record. The Dow Jones Industrial Average 36 points lower. And we check the markets for you all day long. Right here on Bloomberg Radio, I'm John Tucker. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Paul and Tom. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, right now, this is an important conversation. It's on all the rage, ETFs. Yep. There's like, you know, it's like it's like Howard Johnson's. There's 28 flavors or whatever. <laughs> it's like Baskin and Robbins ice cream. And of course, I called up Jennifer Grancio at TCW and I said, the art of, ready? The artificial intelligence oh ETF. I'm sure. Up 50%, 12 months trailing. Where do you come? I mean, how many ETFs does TCW birth in a month, Jennifer? Sure. Yeah, as TCW, we weren't even in this business a year ago. Um, now we have six ETFs, um, and we will indeed have more, maybe you know, two yeah. to five more coming over the next six months. Um, and the way we think about it is we have been an active manager for 50 years and sort of A-plus in equities, A-plus in fixed income, now A-plus in ETFs. And so we're actually trying right. to be very about giving you enough so that you can put a portfolio together uh, without giving you too many. So so if I'm in funds and John Bogle over at Vanguard taught me that I should buy index funds because active managers at sport and I get it. TCW is doing active management. Can you get better active management returns in an ETF versus a traditional open end investment company like a mutual fund? Well, the way I think about it is, you know, a lot of people have used ETFs for index and the index is the index. Um, and now what we're seeing is we're actually seeing an opportunity to make money from an active perspective. And we could talk a little bit more about that, but with rates as high as they are, and they'll be at least somewhat high for a long time to come, if you can pick who wins and who loses, um, you really can deliver alpha. And so the ETF is just a wrapper that helps you with tax. So I think we're seeing two trends come together. One, just an opportunity to add alpha and add active on the portfolio. Got an index, that's great, but take 20% of it, put it over into active, invest in some of these mega trends. And then everybody is demanding the ETF wrapper because it's got some great liquidity and tax efficiency benefits. Where are you seeing the fund flows right now, Jennifer? Where are you guys thinking about the growth of your ETF business? Yeah, so for our business on the equity side, uh, we've launched a range, including artificial intelligence, uh, including a products that let you invest in energy and power and supply chain restoring. We've launched a range of products that are really about mega trend thematic investing, not in and out trends, but mega trends. We're seeing trillions of dollars go into uh, artificial intelligence and then these big power and, and manufacturing changes. So TCW is a leader in these active thematic megatrend products that sit really nicely alongside an index product and help you make sure you're not missing these big trends. And we're starting now a fixed income lineup where on the fixed income side, you know, we've been right. a terrific poor portfolio manager for years. And so in that right. case, we're sometimes converting a fund into an ETF. I mean, you came out of Stanford. Did you take economics with John Taylor when you were a freshman? <laughs> I did, those big classes, those, those gigantic- Did he really he dress as a raisin? Did Professor Taylor come in one day dressed as a raisin? 
he, he used to do that all the time, every term. <laughs> Could you imagine that? The John, he's one of my great, great first supporters here at Bloomberg. And John Taylor right. wassels into 1,200 people. And everybody thinks they're the smartest person in the class, including Jennifer Grancio. And he's dressed as a raisin to pound some humility into him. Jennifer, <laughs> you were at iShares for years. What has TCW learned in their rollout from the lessons of iShares, Morgan Stanley, and the rest? Yeah, I mean, I think, I've, as, as you say, I've, I've been in the ETF industry um, for over 30 years, sort of since the beginning, where we did the work to build an ETF industry and, you know, what what is this crazy wrapper and what can it do for you as an investor? Um, and I think when we look as a business at how we serve clients today, you know, the ETF wrapper has really arrived. It hadn't arrived, it was new, it was an innovation 30 years ago. And so if you look at the wrapper, the wrapper works just as well for an active strategy where you can see what's in the portfolio, you can look at holdings, we can help you manage tax. And right. so I think one thing is the market really has arrived and you've seen it in flows. If you look at yeah. active you know, equity and fixed income flows, they really have shifted to the ETF wrapper, that's one. Um, and right. thing two is you have to know as an investor what you're really good at. And in this day and right. age, ETW ETFs, they have to be additive. They have to do something different than the tools you already have. Right. Jennifer, thank you so much. Jennifer Grandson, uh, 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 TC, there's a lot of uh, alphabet. Alphabets, yes. TCW on ETFs. Thank yep. you um, so much. Uh, we got to wrap it up here because it's been, it's a Thursday. We got to get to Friday. Friday. And I'm sort of like waiting for the 2 p.m. lift in the market. Yep. And then what we haven't talked about for the last two hours is all the politics in Washington yep. and balance of power. We'll have this Joe Matthew Perfect. and Kaylee Lines and all that David Gurr with a great brief um, earlier. But can I, am I off? John Tucker, help me out here. Am I, am I off the mark that today's one of the most important days in recent American history? Am I exaggerating? Well, I, NATO I, well, summit, NATO press summit, conference. Exactly. We have a 630 uh, press conference. Five thirty. Five thirty. The final clock hour, yeah. David. Yeah. Yeah. They moved they to the 6.30, moved 630 oh, we're Sweeney. being told. Yeah. See, I think I because of that, Hanny. Sweeney Hanny's has to right. come in tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, he, no, he, he, we need him tomorrow to be here. No, 6.30 thank you. press conference. Yeah, 6.30 press conference, and so that'll be uh, that'll be telling. Uh, he's, Wait, he's got that, some more events. Wait, is that events. too late for somebody? <laughs> yes. Oh, John. I'm kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm sorry. It's like no, it is. whatever your politics is. I'm this doing, weekend you know, feels, Tom, it just feels like this weekend something will happen one way or the other. And I don't know, I have no idea which way it'll go, but it just feels like, you know, yeah. the, the weekend we'll get some, the press conference today, uh, maybe some more right. lawmakers will weigh in on one side or the other. Um, but again, I, the question I ask some of these political folks is really what is the drop date for <clears throat> making I get a different decision answers. for the party? I get different answers. Uh, so do I. Is it the convention? <clears throat> is it before the convention? Is it now? You know, I don't know. Yeah. In honor of the late great Ken Pruitt, I'm looking for the second day in a row at the CAC 40. Wow, look at you. Off the bottom in the crater here, back to the middle of June with the French elections, the French index, their Dow Jones, yep. industrial average, two days in a row off the bottom. And okay. the basic theme is, and, and Lionel Laurent nailed this, the left's in disarray, and Macron is beginning quiet discussions to get a wider center. Okay, that would be helpful that's about my what would you learn today what was the number one thing you learned today well, besides I, you're taking the ferry well yeah exactly well i've got inflation that is um you know moderating i think probably right in line with what the fed would like to see i yeah. think it i i think if you ask the fed that this this rate of moderation is probably right, right in line with their playbook right. uh and that opens up uh september for potentially a rate cut and as ira jersey pointed out we got a lot more stuff between now and September in terms of economic data. But as of today, you would yeah. think that the Fed could uh, be, you know, be a little bit more cautious. I was thunderstruck by Michael Nathanson's yeah. comments on the Olympics. Exactly. I just was unprepared for that. He's really cautious about and, it. And NBC is not, I'm not gonna say locked in, but they are committed to the Olympics for years. I'm and depressed. Years years. I, so. <laughs> 44 years ago, I can't explain to people younger the impact of this gentleman from Detroit. Yep. Michael Barr called me up. He goes, play Seeger. So we're playing Bob Seeger. He's done like three farewell tours. Yes. It's like Michael Barr. <laughs> Good morning, everyone.